So after reviewing the 2D animated films and the 3D animated films, I was trying to think what would be the next logical step for Disney Simber, and everyone seemed to voice their opinion that they wanted to see the live action films. Well, the problem with that is, there's like a bajillion of them. I have one month to get through these, and it's just way too much. But at the same time, I was thinking to myself, these movies have left a big impact. Just as much, if not bigger, than the animated ones. So it did seem kind of a shame not to talk about them in more detail. So here's what I decided to do. I'm going to go through the live action movies, but only the ones that are the best known. The ones that left an impact. The ones that, whether for better or worse, we remember. The Mary Poppins, the Ben Knobs and Broomsticks, the Pirates of the Caribbean. The films we remember from childhood just as much as Peter Pan's Leaping Beauty and so forth. Now the other catch to that is because, hey, being Disney, they like to do a lot of sequels. And keep in mind, this wasn't just a newer thing, they did this a lot in the past too. So, what I'm gonna do for that is, if one of the movies I'm reviewing does have a sequel, or even a remake, I'll do another video just quickly summing them up, quickly talking about it, but I won't go into as much detail as the main movie. Because like I said, there's a lot of these, and we gotta get through them. And why shouldn't we? A lot of these films are like live-action versions of the animated films. It was so cool to see a woman actually fly. It was so cool to actually see the pirates come out and sword fight with skeletons and all the stuff that we saw on the ride. And of course, we love our animated magic. But at the same time, there was something really cool about seeing that magic come to real life. Or at least, a little closer to real life. It made the illusion just seem a bit more believable. And that's what we're gonna look over. We're gonna look over which ones worked, which ones didn't, and which ones left the biggest impact and why. So, get ready everybody, this is the return of Disney Simber, the live action film. Believe it or not, there's some debate over what was actually the first live action film. Technically, the first one they did was The Reluctant Dragon, but the majority of that is just showing how they made an animated film, that being The Reluctant Dragon. Which is cute and okay, but not much of a narrative. Some argue that the first live-action film is Treasure Island, because it was the first one not to have any animated characters in it. But I'm gonna go for the one that I declare the first actual live-action Disney film, and that's Song of the South. Yeah, I can just feel all the asses around the world clench up just when I say that title. This film has so much controversy about it that it was never released to video or DVD. In fact, I'm probably among the last generation to see this in the theater. Yeah, remember those Nostalgia Critic commercial specials where we have Song of the South being advertised? I remember actually seeing those ads. And of course, I wanted to see it on the big screen. So, is it as offensive as people say it is, or is it really just harmless? Is it memorable? Is it bad? Well, let's take a look. The film centers around a white boy and a white mother who are being dropped off at a plantation. The father, it looks like, has to go back to work as he seems to do a job with some sort of controversial journalism. It's never quite explained. I think it's hinted that it's some sort of race relation thing, but we don't really know if he's pro or con. At least, I never picked up on it. The boy starts to journey around the plantation and comes across a group of slaves, all gathered around one guy named Uncle Ramus, who's told more famous folklore than can be counted. Uncle Ramus is a nice, likable guy who befriends the boy very quickly, telling him stories all about Br'er Rabbit, Br'er Fox, and Br'er Bear. These scenes, of course, are animated. And need we forget he sings that unbelievably catchy song. But a couple of misunderstandings start happen, and the mother doesn't like her son hanging out with Uncle Ramus anymore. But once the dumb little white kid acts like a dumb little white kid and accidentally gets himself in a bullpen, a tragic accident occurs and of course they have to see what's the best way to bring him back and I'm just guessing that Uncle Ramus might play a big part in it. I guess the first thing to talk about is the elephant in the room and that's how this is racially portrayed. This does take place in a time of slavery and it's definitely addressed, sort of. The only major clue to kids would be that at the beginning of the day, they all sort of go over this hill, and then at the end of the day, they all kind of come back. Hmm, I wonder where they went. Everything else in the movie is pretty much just them being laid back and telling stories and having a good time. So I guess for a lot of kids, I don't know if they would catch on. I didn't when I was younger. 
The dialogue, of course, is trying to capture how we thought black people talked back then, and I'm just gonna take a wild guess and say they got some things wrong, but their heart is still in the right place, it seems. In the end, it's pretty obvious that the moral of the story is don't be prejudiced, people come together, listen to one another, so the lesson certainly isn't bad. But at the same time, I'd be lying if I said I didn't feel a little uncomfortable every time they say the term Tar Baby. And yeah, I know the term comes from these stories, but eh, I still feel a little weird. For my money, again, as a 30-something white person, I don't see anything horribly offensive, but if I was a little black kid watching this, I don't know how I would react to it. Regardless, how does the film itself actually hold up? Well, I have a theory that maybe the reason they never push so hard for a DVD release is that the film actually is just kind of... Meh. That is to say, there are still some very strong elements in it. For example, the guy playing Uncle Ramus is unbelievable. I mean, this guy has the biggest heart, the biggest smile, the nicest voice. You just wanna, oh, eat him up. He's just the nicest guy. He's what makes this movie. And of course, having an Academy Award winning song isn't too bad either. It's still catchy, it's still upbeat, and it's a Disney classic. The cartoons are also a lot of fun. They're really funny, they teach some basic life lessons. They're colorful, they're bright, they have really good comedic timing. But honestly, it all kind of goes downhill whenever it's with the White family. Talk about friggin' Wonder Bread, these guys are so boring. It's one of those movies where I thought when I was younger that when I grow up I would understand the depth and drama more like there's other stuff going on that I didn't understand and yeah that's kind of true I didn't really understand the slavery stuff and now I do but there's not really too much else going on. I thought maybe the father's controversial job would play a bigger part but it really doesn't. And the moral is just about as basic a moral as you can get. And without going into too many spoilers here, when the father does manage to come back at the end, there's kind of a choice made that, well, sort of the mother and even in a sense the boy kind of makes in terms of who he wants to see. And while it's a happy moment, it still kind of puts the father in a bad spot. I don't know, it seems to rush up too happy at the end. Wouldn't there be more stuff discussed? Wouldn't there be more conversations? Or I don't know, it just feels like there should be something more. Also, the blending of live action and animation in this is really friggin' good. I mean, this is along Roger Rabbit territory. When something goes in the shadow, they darken it so that it looks like it's in the shadow. When it's further away, they blur the lines. They really did their homework on this, and it's really effective. But there aren't too many scenes like that. Most of it is focusing on the family which, like I said, is pretty boring. So, I'm really torn on it. There's some really good stuff with some good songs and good acting and good performances and good animation, but what it all really adds up to is not really that fascinating, not really that important, and yeah, could be taken the wrong way with racial sensitivities. I don't think it's nearly as offensive as a lot of our stuff that's come out in the past, but again, I'm not sure what people's take on this could be. I guess it depends what you're looking for. If you're interested in some good, positive scenes, then yeah, you'll find them here and just have to sit through a bunch of boring moments too. But if you're looking for a complete film, something that can really take you back and forth through emotions and an incredible journey, this one probably won't do it as much. For me, I'm still glad I saw that great performance, I'm glad I heard that great song, and I'm glad I saw some very funny animation. Do I wish there could have been a lot more depth to it? Yeah, but I think for the one or two elements in it that are good, it is kind of worth talking about and worth looking over. I don't know. In my opinion, if they release it with one of those Leonard Maltin openings or Whoopi Goldberg openings where they talk about the racial insensitivities and how it wasn't right then, it's not right now, all that stuff, I still think they can release it. I mean, hell, if they made a Disney World ride out of it, I think they can release it on DVD. I think the few elements that are memorable are worth remembering. Take it for what it's worth, see if you can find a copy yourself, and draw your own zippity conclusion. Thousand Leagues Under the Sea is not an unknown movie. It gets a lot of attention, and whenever somebody mentions the name, they either think of the book or this version. But I do feel bad as a lot of modern audiences seem to dismiss it, and to be honest, I can kind of see why. Not that it's bad. It's actually really good. 
But when you have something as adult and groundbreaking as 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea and then you have the name Walt Disney attached to it, yeah, a lot of people seem to think that it's going to be a musical or corny, and honestly, it's very adult. And when I say adult, I don't mean trying to get the PG-13 rating up by having swear words and gore and, I don't know, whatever the hell Pirates 3 did. I'm talking about actual adult characters, actual grown-ups, actual good dialogue, actual intriguing ideas. Yeah, remember those? You could still get away with that with a G rating and still have it be a live action film. I'm getting ahead of myself. What's the story? Well, there's rumors of a giant sea monster that's apparently taking down a lot of ships. So one ship is sent out to try and find it and destroy it. Two of the crew members are Kirk Douglas and Peter Lorre. But once the supposed sea monster destroys that ship, our two heroes, along with another survivor, swim aboard this sea monster, apparently, and discover that it's actually a submarine, at a time when, really, there were no submarines. This submarine is led by Captain Nemo, played by James Mason. That's three pretty damn big stars at the time right there, James Mason, Kirk Douglas, and Peter Lorre. All very distinct in their acting styles and work off each other very well. What's Nemo's plan? It turns out he's sick of humanity and the world, so he decides to retire to the sea. But he's so sick of all the misery and war that humanity makes for itself that he decides to step in and try to destroy anything he sees as disrupting the peace. He's cold and stern, but is just trying to do what he feels is best for all of mankind. He doesn't trust our castaways, but over time he does manage to open up to them, treating them less like prisoners and more like members of the crew. As Disney films go, this is probably the most subdued, and that's saying a lot seeing how there's a giant squid that attacks. There are some really groundbreaking effects and some really good visuals. The smart dialogue and the development of the characters is so clear-cut that it's hard not to like them. Their ideologies, their intelligence, their characteristics, everything about them makes them so distinct but also so enjoyable. The effects are also really something. This squid probably would be done with CG nowadays, but back then, they just used a life-size puppet. Originally, it was shot during the day, and Disney said it looked too fake, so he recommended that they do it in a storm. That way, it hides the strings a lot better. The idea of shooting a monster in a storm or in the dark in order to hide what it looks like would be used years later, both for atmosphere and to hide the technicals behind making it. There's definitely changes from the book, but I feel it really still got the spirit of both the characters and the technology really well. And even when they're doing something as silly as fighting a giant squid or using electricity to fight off these natives, it still works because of the dedication of both the atmosphere and the actors. It's kind of like with Indiana Jones. Yeah, when you get down to it, it's a pretty stupid story. But Harrison Ford's performance and just how seriously the direction is taking it makes it one of the great action classics. And while this isn't really an action film per se, I say it does make some really big strong stands for sci-fi and fantasy. But I guess that's why it has such a hard time finding such a dedicated audience. Fans of typical Disney probably won't get into so much dialogue and so much technical talk, and only one or two fight sequences. But fans of that stuff probably can't get too much into like, say, Kirk Douglas's little musical number or the fact that he has a sidekick seal. But for me, I think they blend perfectly. It has just enough to keep kids from falling asleep, but it also has just enough for the parents not to change the channel. I think it's a good mix, even if it does lean more towards the adult side. Which, now that I'm adult, I find I like even more. It's got good adventure, good actors, and good talent telling one of the most famous sci-fi stories of all time. I say it's definitely worth checking out. doesn't know the name Davy Crockett, one of the most famous frontiersmen of all time. Back when Disney was pretty much king of the world, they released a show called Davy Crockett, King of the Wild Frontier. And after the show wrapped up, they decided to put a lot of the episodes together into one big compilation being this movie. So yeah, this is a bit of a cheat, but at the same time, I think it works okay as a film, so I think it's worth talking about. And besides, Davy Crockett has definitely played a large part in Disney's identity, so I think we gotta talk about it. The film, like I said, is a condensed version of all the episodes, so they definitely had to cut a lot of things out. This is funny seeing how the show was already a very romanticized version of a real historical character. So the movie sort of serves as a best of the show. But it still comes off pretty effective seeing how they know just how much character to keep in there and just how many plot points to keep in there. So it never feels rushed or out of place. 
It's just following his journeys of Davy, his partner Russell, finding adventures to partake in, helping peace out ties with the Native Americans and the white man, killing wildlife, and occasionally even seeing the missus and his kids. Yeah, he does that, what, once in the movie? Ah, the 40s, when Family for a Man was more of a side project. With that said, they don't always shy away from the hard truths. For example, the last episode and the last part of the movie is the Alamo, and, well, they lose. As you know happens in history, and they don't shy away from that. But again, it's very romanticized. Everything is played up almost more like a legend than it is actual history. Even the guy who plays Davy, Fess Parker, just look at him with the squinty eyes, chiseled jaw, good looks, very laid back voice. I mean, this guy is practically a frontiersman Jesus. And I think that's the attitude you have to have going into this. That is romanticized, it is played up, it is having fun more with the legend aspect than the historical aspect. Hell, there's actually a scene where he's talking about grinning down a bear. Yeah, that's right, taking down a bear by just grinning at him. There's nothing so absolutely unresistible as an old fashioned good natured grin. Like this. I figured the same thing ought to work on bars, but I never got a chance to find out. It's pretty silly. But I think Fess Parker's performance is so laid back and so confident that I kind of enjoy it. I can see how a lot of history buffs will look at this and kind of laugh, but I think they make the myth that they've created here just so likable that it's hard for me not to have fun with it. Russell's a good side character, there's a lot of good friends and foes that they come across along the way. Some of them stereotypes, but not as mean as you would think. It just sort of has its own strange, unique charm to it. It is cheesy, and a lot of it is kind of fictionalized, but at the same time, it's the kind of story you want to believe. And you have fun believing, even though you know it's probably not true. It's like 300. You know it's overdone, but it's kind of enjoyable how overdone it is. I think that's probably a good way to figure out whether or not you'll enjoy it. If you want to see the true story of Davy Crockett and his adventures, this probably isn't the best version to watch. But if you want to know about the myth, the legends, more the tales that people would tell around a campfire than you would find out of a history book, then I say this is a lot of fun. I know it's hokey, but for me, it's just an old-fashioned good time. the popularity of Davy Crockett the movie and the show being so successful, they of course had to make a sequel. But how the hell do you do that? You see Davy Crockett die in the last film. Well, this one they straight up say is a pure legend. In that, it's completely fictionalized. In that, there may have been a Mike Fink, him and Davy Crockett may have crossed paths at some point, but that's where the history stops. There's no other truth in this. Hell, they even straight up admitted in the song. But most of his chores for freedom and fun got turned into legends, and this here is one. And as one of these totally unneeded sequels just glorifying a myth goes, it's a lot of fun. Not for Davy, not for his partner Russell, but for Mike Fink. Oh my god, this guy is so enjoyable to watch. He is just the right amount of over the top. He's goofy, he's big-eyed, he's always got his mouth open, he's always drinking or smoking a cigar. He's always fighting, he's always punching, he's always looking to get in trouble. You just love this guy. Listen to what a loudmouth he is. I am the original ring tail roarer from the Thunder and Lightning country. I'm a real snorter and a headbuster. I can outrun, out jump, out sing, out swim, out dance, out shoot, out eat, out break, out talk. Yeah, out talk. Look at his expressions. Nothing he does is subtle, but it's just so. Oh my god, you can't stop watching him. Why, that's plain uncivilized piracy. <laughs> Ain't no question about it. Now make up your minds and let me know before morning. You keep me from my drinking. He just steals every single scene that he's in, and it just makes for a great time. Which is good because the story, or stories, there's two in this one, are kind of lackluster. Russell gets drunk and accidentally challenges Mike Fink into a boat race. Mike Fink of course agrees, knowing that Davy and his crew know absolutely nothing about doing any boat work. But through hard work, determination, and their own theme song, they find the courage to actually be a fitting match. While the first half is about the race, the second half totally changes direction. Mike Fink and Davey become friends, and now they're on the lookout to stop some sort of Native American scheme where people dress up like Native Americans in order to rob people, and that's gonna start a war between the white man and them again. Yeah, it's kinda silly. 
but I, who cares? It gives a chance for Mike Fink to be in more of the movie, and I'm totally okay with that. But to the film's credit, it's not all Mike Fink and his gang. I mean, Davy Crockett is still Davy Crockett, and Russell is still Russell. They're both really charming. And once in a while, you come across another funny character. For example, there's this one guy who sends messages in code to a bunch of smugglers about what the boat is carrying. If a boat is carrying gold, he'll sing about a woman who has hair just like gold. And that'll be the cue to rob it. The color of yaller, yaller, yaller gold. This makes for a really funny scene when he discovers that it's actually Davy Crockett and Mike Fink, and how he tries to subtly alert them of what's going on. I thought maybe you fellas might like to hear a little music. It's Crockett and Fink, and down in the hole, there's a cannon and skirt of yellow, yellow balls. It all builds up to a climax with the smugglers, and it's just kind of goofy, silly, hokey goofiness. Which I loved as a kid, and I gotta be honest, I kinda still like as an adult. It's the same reason I like the original Davy Croc. It's just totally glorifying the myth and lore, except this time throwing in a little bit of comedy. But the comedy works! So if you're looking for a lighter version of the Davy Crockett story, maybe without the heavier moments, I say this is a good one to check out. Nothing spectacular, just the right amount of excitement and laughs. Davy, Davy Crockett, tangling with big Mike Fink. Well, before her breakthrough performance in the unbelievably popular Good Morning Miss Bliss, Haley Mills got her start with Disney in the classic film The Parent Trap. The story? Two identical twin girls are separated at birth but then coincidentally meet up at a summer camp. At first they're offended that the other dare look like the other one, and they try playing practical jokes on each other. But after a while, they start to talk to each other more and identify with one another, and find out that they're actually sisters. So they decide to step things up a bit and switch places. One daughter finally meeting her father for the first time, and the other finally meeting her mother for the first time. Eventually it's revealed what happened, and the mother and the father get together and try to decide what to do. While that's going on, the girls try to set a trap, a parent trap, if you will, to try and get them back together. This is especially tricky seeing how the father is marrying another woman, who of course is a stick in the mud who never knows how to have fun and always needs her comeuppance to be given to her by, well, our two main heroes. This is definitely not a movie like Darby O'Gill or Davy Crockett where there's big adventures or anything like that, it's a much smaller kind of story. And as smaller stories go, it's okay. It kept my interest, I wanted to know what was gonna happen, and at the time the split-screen technology was unbelievable, but now it's kind of obvious. Really the focus of the movie is on Hayley Mills, who does a great job as both girls. And what makes it so good is that you know distinctly their personalities and which one is which, but it's never overplayed. It's not like one is super mean and super harsh and the other is like a complete angel. They're both still real girls with real problems and, well, real personalities. And that's tough to do for a child actor. And she pulls it off really well. I'm personally never a fan of those romantic comedies where they're gonna marry the snob and you know they shouldn't be together and they go back and forth whether or not the couple you know is gonna get together is really gonna get together. It drives me nuts. I think that's partially why I like the first half of this movie much more than I like the second half, where it actually is focusing on getting the parents together. The father and mother do make a good couple, it's just, oh, why do we have to have that cliched character there? Uh, at least to this movie's credit, this was done long before this was repeated over and over in, say, Wedding Crashers and other romantic comedies. So I guess you can give it a little leeway there, too. On the whole, I see the movie as kind of a cute waste of time. There's nothing of that much value to it, but there's nothing I feel like I've really lost. It just kind of is what it is, a cute little movie about two girls who look alike and turned out are sisters. They share their emotions, do girly things, get in trouble and mishaps, and it's fine for what it is. It's just not a film I'm gonna be watching over and over and over because I like it so much. But once wasn't bad, I just think that's all I need. If you got the time and you just want to see a charming little film with a charming little child actress, this isn't a bad one to check out. The Parent Trap <laughs> Well, just like I said before, anytime there's a sequel or a remake, I do a fast little review of it. So this is my fast little review of the Parent Trap remake. 
This was of course one of the major introductions of Lindsay Lohan, and one of the big films that turned her into a huge star. And yes, I know there's a lot of jokes you can make about her, what happened to her childhood, she used to be so cute, blah 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 blah, but taking all that aside, let's just look at the performance as it is. It's still a really good performance. In my opinion, she's just as good as Hayley Mills. The technology has really been updated too. This time they can actually touch each other and not have to be at opposite sides of the screen and, you know, all those obvious tricks. The funny thing about this movie though is unlike other remakes, instead of changing too much, I don't think they change enough. It's still the exact same story. They meet at camp, they switch places, then the parents find out, and then they have to get rid of the really snooty wife that he's gonna marry. It's just like, why? We know the faults of the first film. Why didn't they just get rid of this character? The film is so similar in design and its setup, I kind of wonder why it even need to be remade. Was it just to update the technology to tell a story that they thought was already perfect? Did they just think Lindsay Lohan was too friggin' adorable and they had to give her her own movie? A movie where you could have two of her she's that friggin' adorable? I don't know the reason, but as a flick, it's, again, okay. It's about as good as the first one. In my opinion, you could see either of these and probably get the exact same reaction. They both have a charming couple, they both have a good child actress. I say the only real upgrade is the technology, in that the effects are so much better. So, take it for what it's worth. I know, it's weird. It's very strange I come across a film where I have almost the exact same opinion of them, but that's kind of what I got here. I guess it just comes from I was never that invested in the original story, at least enough to care a whole great deal about it. And, well, yeah, it's kind of the same thing here. Which isn't bad, it's fine. It's just for me, it's nothing that spectacular. You go to see some neat effects and a good child actress. That's about it. And if that's what you're looking for, this one's a fine one to check out. Rent both, compare the two, and see for yourself. Looking for a movie that celebrates Irish stereotypes more than The Quiet Man? Well, Darby O'Gill and the Little People is the film for you. Yeah, I'm not gonna act like a lot of this isn't played up to the nth degree and over the top, but oh yeah, it can be painful at times. But again, to its credit, there's a real charm that goes along with it. They have very likable actors that have a lot of heart. The effects are unbefriggin' leavable, even by today's standards. And the story is just a great hodgepodge of all sorts of things Irish and goofy and mythical and legendary and all that fun stuff. So what's the story? Darby O'Gill is an old man who's trying to find the king of the little people. He always tells stories in bars about how he comes across him, but of course nobody ever believes him. But Darby's destined to prove that he's right, and he comes across a well that he falls down through easily the worst effects in the movie. <laughs> Seriously, with all these other groundbreaking effects, you couldn't do that one a little better? And he comes across King Brian and his merry men. They say that he has to stay there forever, but he manages to slip out. When King Brian goes to capture him back, Darby takes advantage and captures him instead. And every time he's trying to prove someone that he actually captured the King of the Leprechauns, King Brian always has some sort of trick to fool him again. So that's one story going on. The other is that Darby has a daughter, a beautiful young maiden named Katie, who apparently is being courted by Sean Connery. Yep, Sean Connery. And on top of that, he sings. She is my dear, my darling one, my smiling and big island one. I love the ground she walks upon, my darling Irish girl. Yep, there's nothing like a Scottish man doing an Irish accent while poorly dubbing his own voice in a musical moment. But things heat up when Katie is on death's door. Only in Irish lore, it's not the Grim Reaper that comes for her, it's the Banshee. A lot of people may remember that I put this as the number one scariest nostalgic moment and everyone sort of called bullshit on it. And yeah, maybe they're right, maybe it is a little silly now, but I'm sorry, this thing still scares the shit out of me. Especially when he opens the door here. That is scary as fuck. Yeah, the effect is kind of dated. Yeah, we know how it's done, but just... Oh, it's just so creepy! And that's kind of one of the nice things about this movie. Even though there's a lot of chipper, upbeat things in it, there is also sort of that dark undertone that's throughout the whole thing. The things that the people want to do in this are actually pretty mean. 
Darby tries to feed the leprechaun to his cat, or the leprechauns try to keep Darby there for the rest of his life. Hell, Darby tries to rob them on several occasions. There's headless horsemen on carriages. It's kind of messed up. It's kind of like a dozen Ace of Fables being webbed together with Irish lore, and it works out pretty well, and still creates for the most part a pretty flowing narrative. The actors, I think, find just that right mix of charming and kind of goofy. The guy who plays Darby is pitch perfect. He is just so enjoyable. He kind of reminds me of a white Uncle Ramus. It's just, how can you not enjoy his stories? How can you not enjoy every single time he opens his mouth and starts talking? He's just freaking delightful. Sean Connery, though pretty unknown at the time, is actually a pretty good lead in this too. I swear to God, Darby's daughter must have the prettiest, most adorable smile in this. Oh my God, I just want to eat her up. Even though she's not dubbed very well either. He is my dear, my darling one, his eyes so sparkling full of fun, no other, no other can match the likes of him. You actually really feel this sense of community in this town. You feel like you understand them and actually kind of want to know them more. You kind of want to go to this pub, or you kind of want to work in these fields, or you kind of want to eat dinner in this house. I don't know, there's just something very homely about it that I really like. Though, yeah, I don't know how Irish people would necessarily look at it because, kind of obviously, it's a bit over the top. It's kind of like how the 70s look back on the 50s and we got Greece. This is kind of how white Americans look at Irishmen and, well, this is the product of that. But I think it's hard is in the right place and, like I said, I think these actors are just so good and so charming and so likable. And the effects are incredible and the music is great and, oh, there's just so much to like in it. So it's hard to say. If you're an Irish person, I can vouch for it, and I could be totally wrong in saying that you won't get offended. You have every right to be offended if you are. But just know that a lot of people nowadays know that this is played up as well, and enjoy it because it is just so fun and silly. Especially if the people watching know that it's played more for goofs and laughs. So I say it's definitely a fun flick, and we're checking out. When people mention a film version of Babes in Toyland, usually the Disney one is the first one that comes to mind. And that either means that's really good, or all the other film versions range from bad to really bad. And yeah, that's kind of my outlook on it. I loved this film growing up, but watching it again, it doesn't hold up that great. It's got a lot of good people, and the money in the production definitely shows, but in terms of the story and the main character, it's kind of all over the place and pretty bland. Surprising for a film that looks like this. Okay, well what's the story? Mary and Tom are just two of the most adorable lovebirds and they're gonna get married. But Barnaby, the evil villain of the town, decides that he wants to marry Mary. How do I know this? Because he literally tells the audience. I'm to get my hands on Mary's money. The person Mary marries must be me, not Tom, me. So he sends his two henchmen to have Tom killed. But the henchmen decide they can make a little money on the side too. So they decide to sell him to a bunch of gypsies. Now that Tom is gone, Mary sees that her only choice is to marry Barnaby. Why? Get this, she can't do the math on her finances. No, I'm not even kidding. There's a whole trippy ass song dedicated to it. Add, subtract, and multiply till you're overcome. This is much too hard for us. We can't do the sum. Barnaby, of course, accepts the offer to marry her and calls in a bunch of gypsies for entertainment. And, wouldn't you know it, Tom's in the gypsy band, and of course they get back together. But then we shift to kind of another story as a bunch of the kids wander into the forest of no return and Tom and Mary go to try and save them. Only to run to a toy maker who makes a device that can shrink things down but then Barnaby seems to follow him and he shrinks everybody down and uses that as leverage to still marry Mary but then Tom breaks open a bunch of the toys and they have this big epic battle and this is weird. So yeah, as you can tell from the story, it's kind of all over the place and, like I said, weird. I'm usually fine with weird, but this movie clearly doesn't have much of a focus, and it's kind of obvious because there's nothing really that much interesting to focus on, at least in terms of the main characters. That's an Ethel Cello as Mary, and she's usually very charming, but she just has nothing to work with here. All she does is cry and look confused. 
The guy who plays Tom has a funny scene as a gypsy fortune teller, but aside from that, he has nothing really that interesting. The kids are all boring. Some of the side characters are kind of neat, but they're not in it for very long. A lot of the songs are pretty pointless, though some of them are kind of fun. The only thing that's genuinely enjoyable about it is the villain. Recognize him? Yeah, that's the Scarecrow from Wizard of Oz. And he just has a great time being the most stereotypical villain, but really playing it up and having fun. This is the guy with the top hat, twiddles his mustache, tied the woman to the railroad tracks, the whole spiel. And his two bumbling sidekicks actually get a few laughs too. I also like Ed Wynn as the toy maker because, well, he's Ed Wynn. Anything he's in is just going to be a ton of fun, even if it sucks. Aside from that, like I said, the look of the production is really impressive. I mean, yeah, it's obviously a set, but it's such a big set. And it's so creative with all the colors and the costumes and the puppets, and it looks really imaginative. Even if it is sort of dressed in that 60s and 70s style that dates it a bit, but not too bad. The music and songs as well, though not always necessary, are still nice to listen to. I could listen to that March of the Toy Soldiers forever. And yeah, we've heard in a bunch of our different versions, but man, does it sound good here. <laughs> After the whole climax is a lot of fun. You spend this good long while building up this toy army with that incredible music and this wonderful stop motion, these great effects, and what does Barnaby do when they finally come in? He just laughs at them. It's sort of like, yeah, they're just toys, why am I afraid of you? But as they keep fighting on and on and on, they tend to get more and more threatening. Until Mary throws that potion at him that shrinks him down, and it's an enjoyable one-on-one -on -one battle between our hero and villain. Even though Mary clearly could just go and step on him, but yeah, it's more dramatic this way. So again, like almost any Disney production, even if it's bad, there's some really cool stuff in it. I do like the scope and size of the production, I do like the villains, and I like a lot of the music. But outside of that, the story and main characters are just so hopelessly dull. But again, as a kid, I did watch it a lot, but yeah, maybe it was for those three elements I listed earlier. I did tend to fast forward it whenever Tom or Mary were on screen. I don't know, if you're looking for an impressive looking kids film without much substance to it, you'll get your fill. But if you're looking for a timeless classic based on a timeless classic, Babes in Toyland, this is probably not the best interpretation. Or maybe it is in film form, but come on, there's gotta be better. Looks great, sounds great, but not too much else to it. Okay, so here's a fun fact you probably didn't know. My dad was in the Navy and got stationed in a lot of various places. So, that actually ended up with me being born in Italy. Yeah, I was actually born in Italy. The reason I bring this up is because, being in Italy, we didn't have that many movies that were in English. So that meant the few movies we had, we just kept watching over and over and over. And the movie by far we watched the most was Mary Poppins. So I know this film pretty well. The songs, the characters, the story, I know it practically inside out. So I guess you can make the argument that I'm already sort of prejudiced towards this movie as obviously I'm gonna love it, but I don't know, I stopped watching this movie for a bit, grew up, looked at it years later, and it's still a damn impressive movie. Not just for the songs, not just for the acting, not just for the effects, not just for the sets, not just for the atmosphere, but for the characters, for the story, for that, oh, just, there's no other word I can use for it except magic. It's a friggin' magical movie. The best way I can describe it is like being cheerfully drunk at a party. You go, you have fun, you dance, you have all sorts of great times, but then you want to get into the serious moment where you want to question life, and yeah, that's kind of here too. It doesn't shy away from some of the really heavy stuff that it's doing, or well, I guess it's simple stuff. I mean, one could almost say it's too simple. It's a father who's a workaholic and needs to spend more time with his kids. That's not so hard. But the way they deal with it and the creative way they talk about it and... Oh, it's just so damn good. Okay, well, let's start from the beginning, as if you guys don't know this story. 
Mr. Banks has two children, Jane and Michael, who are not very good at doing what they're told because the father is always at work and the mother is always out fighting for women's rights. So they request a nanny to sing them songs, give them treats, do all that good stuff. But Mr. Banks hates the idea and wants someone that's stern and strong. So he rips up the letter, but little does he know, it gets whisked up to the clouds where Mary Poppins is waiting. So what, she is gonna be all the fun and games and treat giving and all that stuff we heard about? Well, yeah, but the clever thing about it is that she actually is very strict and stern as well. There's all sorts of weird magical things that go on with her, but at the same time she's very mysterious. She doesn't always smile that much. Even when the magical stuff happens, she'll just deny that it ever happens. It's always kind of keeping you guessing. Even the kids don't always know what to think of it. He won the horse race! A respectable person like me in a horse race? How dare you suggest such a thing? But I saw you do it! As Julie Andrews, of course, is Mary Poppins, and man does she hit it out of the park. Yeah, she can obviously do the really charming, pretty moments where she has the nice voice. That is a nice voice. But again, what sets it apart is when she is strict, and she is just so hard to figure out. I love the way she constantly plays people against themselves. And they're never aware that it's going on. They always think that they came to the conclusion themselves when everything is actually going exactly to how she planned. At my side, where are we going? The bank, of course, exactly as you proposed. I proposed. Of course. Did I say that I was going to take the children to the bank? It certainly sounded that way, dear. Oh. And why not? And of course you have Dick Van Dyke as Bert, and yeah, everyone makes fun of the accent, and it's not unwarranted. It's a really bad Cockney accent. Now this imposing edifice, but first greets the eye, is the home of Admiral Boom. But I really hope that doesn't divert people too much away from, really, still what a good performance it is. I mean, yeah, the accent is distracting. If you can't see past it, I can understand that. But at the same time, look how much energy he's putting into it. Look at all the dancing. Look at all the physical stuff he's doing. Just look at what a great character this is. I love the fact that every time you see him, he always has a different job. I mean, this is probably a guy who lives on the street, but he doesn't care. He's just so happy with life. He's happy with everything. He's just happy to have air in his lungs. Mr. Banks is a perfect bullseye as well. He is a stick in the mud and doesn't ever get the joke, but you see that he's really trying hard, and you see that when he does actually want to bring his kids closer, he is legitimately excited about it. It just has to be about something that he's excited about, and that's of course his work. The memorable moments in this movie are too many to count. Edwin laughing on the ceiling, the Chim Chimney song, the dance sequences with that. Walking on top of the rooftops, blowing the smoke into stairs, that wonderful sunset. Oh god, it's just, it's overload. There's so many good moments of atmosphere, music, and wonder, and just, oh, it takes you back to being a little kid again. And all the effort is there, all the effort that they put into the look of it, and the size of it, and the dance numbers, and the music, and the lyrics, and... Okay, obviously you can figure out, I like this movie a lot. I'm trying to think of what's actually not good about this movie, and the only thing I can really think of is maybe during the scenes where they're playing and having fun, they go on a bit too long and it becomes a bit unfocused, but... I don't know, it's still supposed to be a family film that entertains the kids too, and kids just really want to stay in these entertaining worlds, and in my opinion, it lets them stay there for as long as they would probably want to stay there until it goes on to the next cool thing. Or balances it out with some really touching moments. Remember the Feed the Birds? Isn't that unbelievable? Something so simple as giving money to an old woman to feed birds, and by god, that song! All around the cathedral the saints and apostles look down as she sells her wares. Although you can't see it, you know they are smiling each time someone shows that he cares. I heard this was Walt Disney's favorite song, and you can see why it's something so simple but so powerful at the same time. The way it seems to blend in from one scene to another, going from happy and dancing into something a little bit more heavy and serious, into happy and dancing again, into animation, into live action, it's just a perfect blend. The song sequence Step in Time near the end, I just never want to stop. And it just keeps going and going and going like a party you never want to end. And when it does, it just ends on a perfect note where you just have to catch your breath. It allows you to calm down from this high that you've been going on for the past like 10 or 15 minutes. 
But then again, what makes it so good, I mean so freaking good, is this ending scene when Mr. Banks is walking to his job knowing he's about to lose it. There's no song here, there's no dialogue, it's just him walking down these empty dark roads. And it takes the time to really let this moment sink in, and it's not only one of my favorite moments in the movie, it's one of my favorite moments in film altogether. Listen to that music, look at these shots, you can just feel the atmosphere coming through on the screen. This is a man who's tied everything to his job and now he's about to lose it, which equals to him about to lose everything. And then it comes to this really great moment where he goes to the stairs where the woman feeding the birds was and she's not there. I could be reading too much into it, but I always sort of took it that she may have died. Listen to that choir, is that like the choir you'd hear in a church? But being a Disney film, they can't clearly say that, and I don't know, maybe it wasn't the intention, but that's what I get out of it, because you never see her again. Almost like it's signifying do those good moments when you can, because there may not be another time. It's just such a perfect moment. But of course the ending equals out to a happy one, and it's just the perfect one that you need. I won't ruin it to those who haven't seen it, but even if you know what's gonna happen, it's such a happy, positive delivery, and it's just such a good feeling when you watch it, and such a bittersweet exit for Mary Poppins as well, and just, it brings me back to being a little kid again every single time I see it. But as an adult, I can appreciate so much about it too, not just from a technical level or a special effects level, but from a writing level, from a musical level, from a character level. It's just so strong. This is one of those kids' movies that just every family has, and for good reason. It deserves to be in every family. It deserves to be on every shelf. It's just a wonderful flick. It's written wonderfully, it's acted wonderfully, it looks wonderful, it sounds wonderful. It's just wonderful. How do you top something as big as Mary Poppins? Well, getting almost the exact same group together helps. Yeah, the same director, the same song team, some of the same actors. Let's work in a story that's very similar. Maybe not a magic nanny, but a witch. And maybe not Julie Andrews, but Angela Lansbury. And maybe not Britain, but yeah, okay, still Britain. But completely different kids. This resulted in bit knobs and broomsticks. What in many respects should have been just sort of a lame knockoff trying to recapture the Mary Poppins feeling actually does become its own unique thing. And it's fun, and imaginative, and catchy, and funny, and has Nazis in it. Yeah, we'll get to that, but let's start from the beginning. It's World War II and a lot of our men are sent to war, which means that a lot of kids have to live in foster homes. So three of them are sent to live with Mrs. Price, who is not on board with the idea, but the government says that she has no choice. So she takes them in, and eventually they find out her secret that she is in fact a witch. Originally the kids try to blackmail her with it, but then they remember, oh yeah, she's a witch, and they decide to play nice. But trouble comes a brewing when she realizes that the program that she was getting all her spells from is closing down, and just before the most important spell was going to be sent. You see, she was hoping to use this spell to end the war, but without it, she can't do a thing. So they use her magic to travel on a bed to the guy who created the program, Professor Brown, who we find out is actually nothing more than a con artist magician. You see, he never actually believed in the magic he was spewing out, he was just doing it to make a quick buck. But when he finds it works for Mrs. Price, money signs appear in his eyes and he decides to take advantage of it. At least, tries to. She keeps trying to get the final piece of the spell to win the war, and he just wants to utilize her to get some money. So through a ton of traveling in various locations and a bunch of different spells, they go from one magic situation to another magic situation, including bringing objects to life, traveling to an island where the animals rule, and even getting a chance to take down the Nazi army with their final spell. So yeah, let's talk about that elephant in the room first. The climax of this movie is actually fighting off Nazis, and it's done in a comedic, fun, over-the-top way. You could make the argument that this is really bad taste in the same way that maybe Hogan's Heroes is kind of bad taste. But even though it's clear they're bad guys, you never really see them do anything that horrible. Even the mission they're on is more of a training exercise than it is actual killing people. 
And they're not made to look super horrible, there's definitely some comedic moments with them, but yeah, you could argue that makes it even kind of worse. What, we're supposed to kind of be laughing with Nazis and showing our kids this? Some sensitivities are definitely going to be jeopardized here, so just know this is the climax of the movie, and it never gets bloody or gritty, but like I said, some people might take that the wrong way too. With that said, the movie is really charming and really entertaining. I always said this is sort of what the Harry Potter movies could have been if they wanted to have a little bit more fun with their idea, and not take it so damn seriously. And that's what this movie does. It has fun. It goes from fun location to fun location, introduces great song after great song, great dance number after great dance number, some great effects. And at the center of it is Angela Lansbury and David Tomlinson, who are both fantastic. They take these roles so seriously. But not to a point where it's distracting, it's to a point where they totally suck you in. Even in scenes where they're talking with animated characters, it never looks like they're turning to the camera and winking like, yeah, we know this is kind of stupid. You just totally believe they're really there, because it seems like they really believe they're really there. I also love how David Tomlinson is sort of this likable scoundrel. He is a con artist, but at the same time, he's not a bad guy. And yeah, we do have to go through that scene where he tries to go away thinking that the family didn't get to him and that he doesn't care, even though you know he's gonna go back. And yeah, it's stupid, but you put up with it to get to the fun climax. The song's fantastic. Again, it's the Sherman Brothers, some of the best songwriters of all time, and these are some of their best songs. Boat on the road, boat on the road, sweet where the riches of ages are stowed. The slapstick when they travel to the island filled with animals is a little long, but I don't mind because I love slapstick, and this is some good stuff. The timing, the sound effects, it's all perfect. The climax, again, depending on your sensitivity to the whole Nazi thing, it's still friggin' awesome. It's so cool how they can build up this great comedy, but also this great epic size to it. I mean, just look how cool this is, seeing all this armor come to life. And listen to that kick-ass chant that they got. <laughs> Like I said, it's mostly played for laughs, but it's pretty cool too. If I did have a problem with the movie, I would say that the child actors aren't that great. I mean, the girl does okay, but the two boys are nothing that great. Charlie's delivery is a little too deadpan, and Paul, oh man, I don't even think he's trying. You can eat like a king in a portobello road. But, eh, they're kids, and they're not really the focus. The focus is on our two main characters, as where it should be. Now there is one thing that's really important to note about this movie. If you do see it, make sure you see the original cut. If you get it on DVD, they usually give you the extended, and that's not the one you want to see. I know a lot of times I always say, oh, they left stuff out and they should put it back in, but when they put it back in in this version, it goes on forever. And this movie is already pretty long. I mean, some parts are okay, like David Tomlinson has a song sequence that was cut out that's actually kind of fun. There's one or two moments that are kind of neat to see, but for example, the Portobello Road sequence? In the original, it's really great. It's this long kind of party going on with all these different ethnicities and cultures coming together and having a great time, and when it's done, you're really sad that it's done and there's sort of this emptiness, like the party is over and oh, you just want to go on forever. Well, in the other cut, it does go on forever, and ever, and ever, and ever, and oh my god, it'll just never end! There's a song sequence with Mrs. Price after Professor Brownlee's where she sings about how much she misses him, and it's nice, I guess, but is it really needed? Doesn't it kind of go without saying that she really misses him? Little additions like that can really make it drag on, so I would strongly advise if you are going to see this film, try to see the original and not the extended cut. Only check that out if you're curious to see some of the missing scenes, which are neat, but way too long. But, with that said, I say this is kind of similar to Mary Poppins. Even if it does take sort of a different direction that's more of action-adventure than it is a charming little kid story. Hell, you could argue it's like Mary Poppins with swords. And what the hell's wrong with that? I absolutely love it. I love the story, I love the characters, I love the performances, I love the songs, I love it all. It's an awesome adventure that's definitely worth checking out. Have you ever wanted to see a child-friendly version of Christine? Well, the love bug is it. 
this is the story about Herbie, a car who is in fact alive. He attaches himself to a driver, played by Dean Jones, who's down on his luck and can barely pay the bills, so he tries to find a new car to enter some races with. Of course, Herbie doesn't seem like the kind of car to win a lot of races, but it follows him home! So he strikes up a deal with the guy who owns the car, played by David Tomlinson, who hands him over and sure enough, he's winning a ton of races now. But Tomlinson, who of course is a racer himself, starts to catch on himself that the car is alive and so he makes Dean Jones a deal. Whoever wins the most races will officially own the car. No more payments needed. So, quite literally, the race is on to see who can win and who will take permanent ownership of Herbie. Of course, being a Disney film, there's side characters, there's romance, there's a lot of goofy comedy and a lot of great visuals. When you actually say the synopsis to yourself, though, a car that's alive, what do you really expect out of this? I think going in with that mindset, you might find that the movie is actually a bit better than you think it might be. But again, going in with the mindset that it's about a car that's alive. First off, the car doesn't talk or have any eyes or a mouth or anything like that. It's all just done through its actions, which some would argue wouldn't form that much of a personality. But with the passion and caring that the side characters as well as the direction takes, you do sort of get an idea of what he's like. He's energetic, he's thoughtful, he's kind, but he's also very easy to offend. He's got a big heart and always wants to do what is right, even if he can get a little jealous at times. Heck, he can get downright depressed. There's actually a scene where he tries to commit suicide. Yeah, it's that kind of weird friggin' movie. So, if you can allow the goofiness of this to kind of set in, it's actually kind of enjoyable in just how goofy it is. It strangely works because, even though there is a lot of comedy and goofy moments, the direction actually takes it kind of seriously. In fact, you kind of laugh at how seriously it's being taken sometimes. Again, a car committing suicide. Really think about that without laughing. It's taking a goofy subject so seriously that after a while, when you're done laughing at it, you too almost kind of take it seriously. Well, the key word being almost. Dean Jones is a good lead, Michelle Lee is good support, Buddy Hackett is Buddy Hackett, again, just sort of adds to the goofiness. But easily the best part is David Tomlinson as the villain. It's strange that he's been in so many Disney films, but he's never straight up been the bad guy. He was a hero in Ben Odds and Broomsticks, and in Mary Poppins, he wasn't really a villain, he was just sort of led in the wrong direction. But here, he's a straight-up baddie, and oh my god, does he just relish every moment of it. Look at that snobby smile, look at those eyes fume whenever he gets angry. Listen to that voice whenever he screams. I demand that this thing is impounded and checked. Now I finish being generous, George. Blast you, Hammershaw, how dare you patronize me? I tell you, there's more going on here than meets the eye. Ah! I am not losing my nerve! I've got to find out what! You can't help but laugh every time he's on screen. He steals every single moment. The slapstick, as well as the driving in this movie, is pretty damn impressive. Again, it's over the top, it's cartoony, it's so silly, but yeah, it gets a giggle. I think my absolute favorite is when Tom Winston gets knocked into the car and they find out how he's in there. Get me out of here! I piss my fans every time I see that scene. Some scenes are definitely a product of the times, but actually that can get a good laugh too. Like here's something that definitely only makes sense back then, but it's still really hilarious. Help, I'm a prisoner! I can't get out! We all prisoners, Chicky baby. We all locked in. It's all for something so silly as a car is alive. But again, you kind of give it credit that it never quite went too far. Like I said, as giving it a face or like a voice or anything like that, that would have been total overkill. But this, this is just the right amount of Goofy. If I did have a major criticism of it, I would say it is a little too long. There's only so many times we can see Dean Jones get sad and then brought back up and that looks like they're gonna lose and then they're back in the game again and then they have to convince somebody else that Herbie's alive and yeah, it's sort of repetitive. It could have used a real trimming. But again, for what we could have gotten, this isn't that bad. Or at least it's entertainingly bad. But with good elements that kind of make it entertainingly good, I, oh, I don't know. Just say the phrase, it's a movie about a car that's alive. If you have no interest in an idea like that, then you're not gonna like this movie. But if you're even remotely interested, I say there's a chance that this could actually get some good laughs out of you. It's hard for me not to like it. There's just something so innocent and silly about it, as well as a lot of effort. Yeah, it's stupid, but I can't help but like it. Herbie will always have a place in my mechanical heart. Okay, 
Okay, so I said I would talk about the sequels and remakes to a lot of these movies, and with Herbie, oh my god, there are so many. It's funny when you think of Disney and all the sequels and characters that they use that Herbie is not usually mentioned among them, but he has a ton of sequels and remakes. There's Herbie Rides Again, Herbie Goes to Monte Carlo, Herbie Goes Bananas. There's a remake with Lindsay Lohan. And yes, there's even a remake with Bruce Campbell. Bruce Campbell drove Herbie. It's so friggin' weird. And pretty much all these movies range from eh to weird and surreal. Eh. I don't know, it's hard for me to think of a movie that was downright painful, like it was so bad I just wanted to turn it off, but at the same time, none of these really grab me that much. Some of them have some really surreal moments, like in Herbie Rides Again. I remember the villain has a dream that a bunch of evil Herbies are chasing him and trying to eat him. Yeah, it's pretty out there. But after that, they all kind of gel together. It's somebody discovering the car is alive, trying to convince themselves it's not alive, but coming around to realizing it is alive and trying to convince other people that it's alive, them not believing, and then coming around, winning some races, hijinks ensue. I don't know. In all honesty, the idea only had possibility for one movie, and even then, it wasn't really that much possibility. They just kind of got lucky in how goofy it was and how much passion they put into it. But then again, there is sort of this weird, funny charm to some of them as well in just the idea. Again, Bruce Campbell driving Herbie. Just watching him talk to the car is kind of funny. But really, that's just kind of a kitsch thing. Like, oh, isn't it funny if you know who Bruce Campbell is and know what Herbie is to see them together talking? But yeah, that's not really enough to make it last throughout an entire movie. There's one with Lindsay Lohan and Michael Keaton, and... Yeah, what really annoys me about this one is, remember how I was saying how great it was before that Herbie never really had any eyes or he didn't talk or anything like that? Well, here they tried to give Herbie a face. Yeah, it'll roll its eyes, it'll kind of smile, and it really doesn't work. I don't know, just something about talking cars, they never work for Disney. I think it's more fun if you just kind of guess what the car is feeling and you kind of put your own emotions onto it. But when we actually see it react to something, eh, it's pretty dumb. I guess I give it credit that the series apparently had enough steam for so many movies and remakes, but again, I don't know how many people really talk about it or remember them. They're kind of like the Disney direct-to-DVD sequels, you just kind of go, oh, that existed. And again, I don't recall any that were like a sin against nature bad, but I don't think any really require that much of a viewing. If you're gonna check them out, I'd say do it just for mere curiosity. Don't expect to get anything that great out of it. If you do have that curiosity, go and find out for yourself. It's one of Jodie Foster's first big hits, Freaky Friday. Yeah, this is just at the time when the whole switching body and mind things was kind of big, and Disney had to do their take on it too. And for what they did, it's not bad. The story is about as textbook as you can get. A mother and daughter don't get along and they're constantly screaming at each other, and one day they say, wouldn't it be great if we switched places and you knew what it was like to be me? Well, one day, that's exactly what happens. They switch around and sure enough, they're stuck in each other's bodies. The daughter has to be mother and the mother has to be daughter. As you imagine, they're in way over their head, they have trouble making friends, and yeah, they find out, maybe it is hard being this person. The movie was a big hit when it came out, and yeah, I can kind of see why. It is funny, it is charming, both actresses do a good job impersonating the other. But there is a part of me that feels it's just a little too dated. Not to say that isn't funny at times, or really a lot of fun, but I don't know, don't you know exactly from the beginning where this is gonna go, and don't you know half of these jokes that are coming? And I think with a story like this that's been done so many times, you have to add a little bit more to it. And here, I I just don't see that much more added. Again, apart from two very funny performances and sort of the standard textbook stuff that you do with this story. But it's cute, it's fun, like I said, everybody acts well even if it is over the top at times. Seeing them interact in different environments while still keeping that mindset is always cute to see. I don't know, it just for me I feel like nothing too much else is added to it so I don't know the incredible value of watching it, except maybe for the performances, which are funny but not phenomenal. I don't even know really what else to say about it. It's cute. If you want to see a story about a mother and a daughter who switch places and they have to interact, it's fine. I just wish they could have added something a little bit more. 
But maybe that's not what it's supposed to be. Maybe it's just supposed to be your straightforward comedy with this straightforward scenario, and that's pretty much what you get. Like I said, not too much of a review because I just can't think that much to say about it, but if you're into this kind of very basic story, you'll like it fine. If you want something a little bit more meaty, well, maybe take a look at the remake. Yeah, I just said that. You wanna know why? Go watch the next video. Like to be you for a day. Here's my quick little review of the remake of Freaky Friday, and ironically, I might actually have more to say about this one because I think this is one of the few remakes that's better than the original. The setup is still the same, it's still a girl and her mother who switch places, but this time it's played by Jamie Lee Curtis and Lindsay Lohan. And truth be told, I just think their performances are better. And on top of that, I think they take more of the opportunities that's offered to them with this scenario. Not only do they make fun of their celebrity, like when Jamie Lee Curtis looks at herself and says she looks like the Crypt Keeper, but there's also more opportunity in the fact that, well, the mother's allowed to work in this version. And to me, that's part of what can make it really funny, a child going into the work world and not knowing what to do. In the original, the mother stayed home, and I'm not gonna act like that's always easy peasy either, but there's just more comedic possibilities with going into the office. And on top of that, our youth at that time got a little bit more cutting edge with technology and bands and trying to be more hardcore and all that fun stuff, and, well, that's more fun to see an adult try to fit into. Even though if, yeah, some of it is getting a little dated, but to me, it's still funnier. Hell, I think the original Freaky Friday actually might have been a little funnier if it was a little bit more dated. Like, what if she did get a little bit more into the hippie culture, or protesting, or the wars, or something? I don't know, just something to make it a little funnier. But in this one, they take every advantage, and it's a ton of fun. Once again, Lindsay Lohan is great, both as the teen and as the adult in the teen's body. And Jamie Lee Curtis does a wonderful job as always. She's great as the stern mother, but also great as the kid in the adult body that's trying to have fun, but learning responsibility. And I don't know, maybe because more of these cliches have been done in the past, there is more of this pressure to not repeat them. And yeah, you gotta hit a few, and they do, but at the same time, they try to keep it a little bit more fresh, which I like. They try to throw in new, weird things with the current generation, which I think is a big difference between something like the Parent Trap remake and the original, where really there wasn't that much of an update. Here, there's a huge update. Technology has changed, and schools have changed, and when the idea is an adult trying to go into a kid's body and trying to adapt, it's much funnier because you know how much adults are behind on all that stuff. Particularly parents. So, I'm not necessarily blaming the original movie for not being good enough, it's just that I think with the changing times, with the upgrade in technology, and more women going into the work world and stuff, there's just more comedy to it. And like I said before, getting rid of a lot of past cliches, but still keeping the ones that are probably needed to make the story work. And I know there's a lot of people that are gonna love the original, and that's fine, go ahead and like it, there's nothing really wrong with it, it's just, in my opinion, there's a lot more that's done in this one. They're definitely fun movies to compare and contrast, so when you get a chance, maybe watch them back to back and decide which one you like best. For me though, it's definitely the remake. Pete's Dragon. This is a movie I so desperately want to like, because there is obviously so much effort put into it, and there are some great songs, and there are some great effects, but... Oh, it's just so corny. To me, it's kind of like a more restrained Babes in Toyland. There's some really cool stuff, but god, it's just all over the place and so cheesy. But isn't that kind of what you expect from Disney? I, uh, alright, let's look at the story. A boy named Pete is running away from home because he lives with a terrible family of rednecks. So he comes across a town called Passamaquoddy and tries to see if he can fit in and find a new family. The trouble? Pete has a pet dragon that can turn invisible whenever he wants. Of course, being Disney, the dragon is animated. But that still doesn't stop for some scenes still building a live-action version, like when he's covered in a net. That's actually pretty impressive. He does come across a kind woman and her father who are looking to take him in, but his pet dragon keeps getting him into more and more trouble, and the more he has to keep him visible, the more the mother is afraid that, well, the dragon doesn't exist. But one person who does think he exists is our villain, and his bumbling sidekick. 
They want to capture the dragon and chop him up into a million pieces because apparently every part of a dragon can be used as some sort of tonic. There's even a song about it. Dragon cartilage keeps you thin. Dragon fat is for burns. A dragon tear will clear up your skin. The number one problem is that unlike films like Ben Knobs and Broomsticks or Mary Poppins where they never quite wink too much to the camera or never fully let in how cheesy it all is, this kinda does. It's hard to say, everyone just seems a bit too over the top. Even the kid that's supposed to be sort of the normal nice kid is a little too over the top normal nice. There's nothing much to him. The only characters that really seem to find that right balance, even though they are still over the top, is the mother, who seems to have a fun but tough attitude about her, and the villain, who of course is such a cliché with the top hat and the big mustache, but oh, it just looks like he's having so much fun, it's hard not to kind of laugh with him. I guess you could argue sort of the over the top take on it is part of the charm, but I don't know, for me it's just a little too silly. Which is not to say there isn't a lot of stuff to admire. Like I said, the animation on the actual dragon is really good. It does lead to a lot of really good effects when they have to make him invisible. The songs are a lot of fun, again, most of them coming from the villain. And like I said, I do enjoy the villain himself and the mother character. But I think the story is just a little too all over the place. Again, kind of like Babes in Toyland. And the main character is so dull and you just don't care what happens to him. And even the songs, as good as they are, don't keep that much focus. I mean, there's a scene where the father sees the dragon and he goes in and he starts singing about it. And it just goes on forever. It leads into this gigantic musical number just about how nobody believes him. And it's just like... Yeah, it's cool, but why are we singing this about whether or not they saw a dragon? It's like, where did this come from? Why should we be invested in it? In fact, are you even singing about the dragon anymore? It's in your face and not the least bit subtle, and I guess I would understand if that did find an audience. And it did. The movie did well, and I still know there's people that watch it even today. I'd be lying if I said I didn't watch it a few times for the elements I listed before, but anything else I watch it for is more just for kind of mockery of it. I mean, that redneck family is so silly, and these song sequences are so goofy. And everything is just so played up and not subtle that, I don't know, I guess there's sort of something fun about that, but I don't think it makes for technically a well put together film, but rather a giant mess that has some good elements to it. As a whole, I think it's just too overblown. Take it for what's worth and see for yourself. Did you know that Popeye is technically a Disney film? Yeah, it's one of the few times that Disney actually worked with another studio to get a film made. And I'm here to talk about it today. Why? Because, in my opinion, I think too many people hate on this movie. Okay, it's not great. Okay, it almost destroyed Robin Williams' career. And okay, maybe it is a completely pointless film to have around. But with all those factors taken in, uh, let's just look at the story. Robin Williams is Popeye the Sailor Man. He comes into town just looking to make a living for himself, and he ends up in a giant house with a giant family, one of them being Olive Oil, played by Shelley Duvall. And if you know the Popeye cartoon, you kinda know the other characters he's gonna come across. There's a character obsessed with hamburgers named Weepy, a cute little baby named Sweet Pea, and a giant bully named Bluto, who always wants Olive Oil, but Popeye is always there to fight for her. Well, that's all fair and good, but is that enough to make an actual story on it? The answer is, not really. So this story sort of goes all over the place. One minute, it's about him fitting in and getting annoyed with this tax collector. Another minute, it's about him entering a fight and trying to win this big cash prize. Another minute, it's about the baby and how he can predict the future, guessing what's gonna win what race. And another point, it's about him trying to find his long lost father. And at another point, it's about Bluto wanting to marry Olive Oil while also looking for buried treasure. It's like, holy smokes, what isn't going on in this movie? This isn't Popeye the movie, this is Popeye the five or six cartoons thrown into one. But strangely enough, for all the stuff that is going on in the movie, it has a very laid back tone. And I think that's sort of what throws people off, but in my opinion, I think is kind of delightful. All the actors, for what they have to do, portray their parts fine. A 
lot of it is just them living in this town, interacting off each other, and just trying to make a living. And once in a while, I don't mind seeing a movie like that. In fact, I actually would have maybe liked a little bit more if it was more on the town and they didn't have to go looking for treasure and all that stuff. But on the other hand, it is a Popeye movie and you kinda gotta do something similar to that, you know, rock em, sock em, eat the spinach, all that stuff. There is a lot of slapstick, and granted a lot of it is kinda slow because, well, you're always gonna be comparing it to the cartoon, and it's not gonna be as fast as the cartoon, because back then technology wasn't good enough to do that, but I think it's okay, because once again, it is so laid back. That's Robert Altman who directed this, and if you know anything about his work, you know that he usually directs very slow, atmospheric movies. And this movie does have a lot of atmosphere. The Popeye cartoons, when you really think about, are kind of quiet cartoons, at least when thinking of the older ones. Yeah, there's the song in the beginning and end, but they're usually very quiet, and a lot of it is sort of lazily dubbed over, but eh, it kinda didn't matter, it just sort of had its own feel to it, and that's kind of what I think of with this movie. It's just kind of its own weird weird thing. And I think if it was trying too hard to have so much action and adventure and too many jokes, then maybe it couldn't have worked, but I think because it is so slow paced and it does sort of go at its own rate, it doesn't bother me. At the very least, it's an artist just sort of having fun with his version of something that was really popular. And it didn't feel like it was compromised, he was just sort of telling it the way that he saw it. But does that technically make it a good film? Yeah, probably not. Like I said, it is all over the place, it is pointless for existing, and, well, the slapstick can't match with the original animation. But I think for me, there's just sort of this nice environment to it, and it has some nice songs, some actual catchy songs. If you're looking for this great big grand adventure that has a lot of comedy that you're gonna be laughing your ass off to, this definitely isn't the movie, but I don't know, if you're a person who likes to spend some days just sitting back and chatting with some friends and doing nothing much else, this is kind of like the cinematic version of that. You know, with a few goofy moments thrown in, but hey, that happens a lot of laid back conversations too, right? I can't help it, I have a soft spot for this movie. And if you don't like it, I'm not gonna act like I don't understand, I do, a lot of people can find it boring, they can see it as not very funny. But for me, I see it as just kind of a nice film to pop in to relax to. It's got a few funny visuals, some fun performances, some enjoyable songs, and a lot of good atmosphere. Yeah, it's cheesy and corny, but for making Popeye into a movie, what did you expect? I actually think it's a lot better than what they could have had. At least, for the time period and what technology would allow. Now you could probably make it all CG with a lot of in-jokes and adult jokes and stuff, but for back then, I don't think this is half bad. From my point of view, it's tough to the finish. <laughs> It's the cult hit Tron, and boy do I not want to talk about this movie. Not because it's really bad or anything, but I just hate talking about the plot. Why? Because it's really confusing! And I don't know if that means I'm dumb, or I'm just not a computer programmer, or I just have a hard time paying attention to this kind of stuff, but man is it hard to follow. But I'll give it a shot. Flynn is a programmer who had an idea for a video game, but another person named Dillinger stole the idea and made millions off of it. So Flynn is determined to hack his company and see if he can find anything to prove that he invented the game first. But little does he know he's getting into something much bigger than he can ever imagine. And this is where it gets a little confusing. Flynn is sucked into the world of computers. There's a whole other world going on that apparently we don't know about, and it's all going on inside our machines. Programs are represented by people, digital people. And they have a theory that they're being controlled by other people named users, but that's more of like a religion. Which is actually pretty clever. Flynn finds out he has to stay in this world because it'll please the Master Control Program an evil entity that's controlling Dillinger and forcing him to get information on the Pentagon and other government securities. Obviously wanting to take over the world, of course. But Flynn does come across a friend named Tron. Tron is a security program invented by his friend to actually stop this sort of thing from happening, from Dillinger getting too much information, or anyone getting too much information. So it seems like he's the only one that can feasibly stop it. So did I get that right? I hope I got that right, cause man it's not easy to transcribe. 
I'll give the movie credit that the setup for the story is kind of told out of order and you do have to think in order to follow it, so it's kind of nice that it's not entirely spoon-fed to you. But since the computer age has exploded, we've gotten to know a lot of these terms and even now it's still kind of hard to follow. Now that's not to say you can't entirely follow it, you just really gotta pay attention. Maybe that's why when the film first came out, it wasn't that big a hit. But I can also see why that would also be how it got an audience over time. Because there is a lot of clever commentary, particularly with the religious aspect. The users are apparently controlling the programs, but the programs also have souls of their own, so who's really controlling who? There's a lot of fun stuff that can be had with that, and they do tap on it quite a bit. You can tell the majority of the time spent on this movie is perfecting its look. Which, while we're at it, let's talk about the look, because it is by far the best part of the movie. This film has a design that is all its own. I mean, yes, it's 80s, yes, it's bright neon against black, but at the same time, you look at this and the first thing you think is Tron. There's not really a lot of other movies that have this specific a design. And its use of CG animation was also groundbreaking and never really been done to this extent before. Nowadays, it's pretty dated, but it's still so stylized and looks so good that you kinda don't care. You know it was the 80s, and you know it's just a product of the times, but man, is it such a good-looking product of the times. Some of it looks a little cheap, like the costumes themselves, I don't know, they're supposed to be like neon and glowing, but they kinda look like pajamas half the time. Some set pieces I think were supposed to look like hard metal, but they look more like cardboard. But again, you kind of give it a pass because it's designed so nicely. And it is so unique. And it's shot so well. I love it where even when you enter the human world, you're not entirely sure if you're in the human world. They keep going back and forth, sort of blending the realities, and that's really smart. Again, sort of playing with the idea of who's controlling who. Tron is one of those movies where when you really think about it, it is really smart and it is really clever, but you really gotta take that time to think about it. In terms of just a straightforward action adventure, it can please people, but like I said, you gotta pay close, close attention to it. And I'm sure there's things that don't add up and are never explained and real computer programmers would probably look at this and be like, hey, they forgot this or forgot that. But honestly, I think that's just the sci-fi element. That's people making stuff up for entertainment as well as try to get what other symbolic point they're trying to get across. I think because I'm not a huge computer guy, I can't get into this stuff quite as much, but I do acknowledge it is a good film, and it is very smart, even if it is cheesy here or there, and again, even if the designs are a little dated, but it's still something all its own. It's a good flick, and my guess is there's a lot of people out there that would enjoy it even more than I do. It's just a little too much going on for me to really love, but I liked it, and I'm glad I saw it. But it's proven that it does have a die-hard audience, and you can see why. It has a look that's all its own, it has a story that's all its own, and it is really clever. Yeah, it can be a little cheesy and awkward, as well as incredibly dated. But still, when you get down to it, there's only one Tron. After years of waiting, a sequel to Tron has finally come. It's Tron Legacy. The reaction to this film seemed to be very split, and it seemed to be with very specific people. Anyone that was waiting for years and years to see a sequel to Tron usually don't like it. But the typical moviegoer just looking to have a good time with some okay effects and action seemed to like it fine. And seeing how I never got that big into Tron to begin with, yeah, I guess I'm on that boat too. The setup is, years later, Flynn's son is the CEO of a gigantic corporation. But he's also a lost rebel that likes to sabotage his own corporation. Yeah, try to make sense out of that. He's upset because he could never find out what happened to his father, but suddenly, all his questions are answered when he himself is sucked into the video game world. He finds what he thinks is his father, but honestly it's just a lookalike called the CLU. The CLU, of course, wants control of everything, and wants to keep Flynn as far away from it as possible. So, just as he's about to axe Flynn's son, Flynn's apprentice comes in and saves the day. Reuniting the son with the father. And here's where it gets confusing and complicated again. I guess the reason that all this happened is because Flynn, while staying in the program, discovered some form of life that created itself and apparently has all the answers to life, the universe, religion, all that stuff. This is what caused the big split between Flynn and the CLU. 
And the race is on to who can have total control of everything to take over the world or something like that. Like I said, it gets weird and complicated. And let's face it, that's not the kind of movie this is. This movie is here to be a straightforward action adventure with cool effects and a unique design and yeah, that's pretty much what we got. I give it credit for tapping on some of these ideas, but they don't really follow all the way through with it. Or if they do, it's in a story that's way too complicated to understand. I guess in a way it is very much like the first one, as it is hard to follow, but with the first one it was tied in much more to the story and what was going on. Here it's just sort of more of a side event, while the rest of the movie is busy making excuses to have fight sequences. But they're fun fight sequences, and there's a lot of great visuals. Is it great action? No, but I will give it credit for having a very unique design that adds on top of the original Tron film. You do look at this universe saying, yes, this is still Tron, but at the same time they've really updated it. And it isn't just cleaning up the effects, it is still giving it its very unique look. Like, if you were to put on Tron and then Tron Legacy, you could clearly tell which one was which. So for me, I think the film is okay. I wasn't expecting much, and I got actually a little bit more than I expected. At least with the visuals and the action. But anyone hoping for some sort of groundbreaking film or the sequel you've been waiting years and years to continue the grand story and answer a lot of the questions, you're not gonna get it here. This is a punch em out movie with some nice effects and one or two ideas that are just sort of tapped upon. So hopefully you can figure out if that'll be to your liking and you can see for yourself. I've talked about this film a ton of times, now I'm gonna talk about it again. Return to Oz. This has started to get a cult following as that film that scared the shit out of you as a little kid, but we all really liked. And yeah, that's kind of my memory too. I don't remember being so scared that I was crying at this film or anything, but yeah, I do remember it being pretty damn creepy and unsettling. But it was okay because it drew me back in with such a nice main character and such nice side characters and a lot of creativity and yeah, you know what? I really like this flick. Even if it does have a lot of dark, creepy elements. Speaking of which, let's look at the story. Dorothy, having returned from Oz, talks all about the world she's been to to Auntie Anne. But of course, everybody doesn't believe her. At first they think it's childish play, but she just keeps talking about it and they're getting more and more concerned. And then she starts to fall into a deep depression. So they're gonna take her to a doctor to try this new method that apparently is gonna fix her up right away. It's called shock therapy. Oh yeah, I can see a lot of good things coming from this. But one of the nurses, or was it patients, I was never quite sure, saves Dorothy and sends her out in the middle of a storm. Actually, it might have been safer just to leave her there. But when she wakes up, she's back in the land of Oz. But the Scarecrow is no longer in charge like when she left. Instead, it's taken over by this evil queen with a million heads and the Gnome King, who soon will have control of all of Oz and Dorothy is the key. Along the way, she comes across some interesting characters like a robot named TikTok, another Scarecrow-ish creation called Jack Pumpkinhead, a talking chicken, and even a flying couch. Yeah, how's that for an out there cast of characters? And that's the word to describe this movie, out there. There are some strange, creepy creations in this, like the wheelers. Oh my god, when these things first pop up, they'll scare any kid. A lot of the shots and imagery in this film, a lot of critics complain are too scary. And yeah, okay, I'm not gonna act like I don't see where they're coming from, but in my opinion, it never goes too far. It never goes bloody, it never goes too gritty, it never goes sexual, it never goes into anything that's ethically bad. It's just creepy, but yeah, a lot of kids can handle creepy stuff, and if your kids are frightened by this, yeah, I'll understand. I'm not recommending it for everybody, but let's be honest, there's a lot of kids out there that like to be afraid. I was one of them, I know plenty of people that were too. And the fact that this film does have such a following from people that love it, not because it's so bad it's good, but because it's so good it's good. There is a charm to these characters, and there is a kindness, and Dorothy is very likable, and TikTok is a great character, and Jack is so likable. I like these characters, and I like this world, even if it is kind of in ruins. The whole movie has sort of a surreal dreamlike quality that both ranges from really pleasant nice dreams into horrific nightmares. But I think there's a lot of kids and adults that can relate to that. 
If it was nothing but hardships all the way through, or it didn't have a good, nice main character, then it probably wouldn't have worked. But there are some decent moments, and there are some nice creative times, and there is a lot of kindness from our main cast. And like I said, the creativity is wonderful. There's a lot of stop motion in this film, and it looks really great. It actually reminds me a lot of the Harryhausen days. It just looks really good. And the rest of the effects are damn impressive too. There's so many puppets, there's so many giant sets. It's just a great looking film. I think for me when I was a kid, I respected films like this because I felt like they were giving me a chance to feel a little older. They were trying to scare me. They were trying to make me a little tougher. And I didn't mind that. I wanted something that was gonna challenge me a bit. And for kids, something that's scary but still engaging is kinda challenging. How can we like something that we assume is bad for us and gonna scare us, but yet we keep watching it? I did a whole editorial about this, and if you wanna hear more about it, go watch that. But that's not why I'm here. I'm here to review this movie. And in the end, I think it's a damn good movie. I think it's charming, it has a lot of heart, and yes, it has a whole lot of scares. But they're creative scares and they're fun scares, and in my opinion, they never go too far. Is it like the last cinematic Wizard of Oz? No, it's something entirely different as based more on the books. Which could get really dark and really grim. But the reason they worked back then is because there was this charm to them, and there's a charm to this movie too. So I can't help but really enjoy it. If you're curious for yourself, check it out and get ready to have your childhood bejesus is scared out of you. Here's another film I've talked about a lot on this website, Flight of the Navigator. This is another one of those often overlooked Disney films that really needs more attention. Is it great or phenomenal? No, but it does such a good job with its build-up and does come around to giving kids a very fun fantasy to partake in. The idea of controlling your own spaceship. What well, kid wouldn't love that idea? The story centers around Davy. He's a common everyday boy who suddenly falls in a ditch and wakes up years later. His mom, his dad, his brother, everybody is aged. Nobody quite knows why, but scientists have a theory that it connects to the spaceship that suddenly appeared. The spaceship keeps sending him messages in all sorts of different ways, and the scientists are trying to figure out what the connection is. The boy eventually is drawn to the spaceship so much that he goes to visit it. And sure enough, the spaceship has an alien creature inside that Davy calls Max, who says that Davy and a bunch of other life forms that he's taken from other worlds were all part of an analytical experiment. But something went wrong, and the star charts to get him back home are in Davy's brain. So that means the control of the ship is now under Davy, and he makes a deal that if Max can get him back home, he'll give him the star charts that are in his brain. Everyone likes to say the film is sort of split into two halves, the first half being a lot of build-up and a lot of science talk, and the second half which is a straightforward kids movie, with the kid enjoying the spaceship and talking with the alien life form, telling jokes, all that fun stuff. And that is true. For a kid, they work out perfectly. For an adult, the first half is definitely a lot better than the second half. The build-up is just so friggin' good. I love watching this movie with a person who's never seen it or even heard of it before and watching that scene where they have the computers hooked up to his head. David, where have you been for the last eight years? I don't know. The look on audiences' faces when that word pops up is always great. Again, it's just an idea of how good the build-up is. And kids won't find it that boring because the focus is still on the boy. It's all from his point of view, so you're okay wanting to follow him. And the second half, like I said, is delivering the kids what they want to see. A boy on a spaceship, flying around, having fun. And don't get me wrong, it's still good. I mean, there's nothing wrong with it at all. It's just, man, with that build-up, you're thinking it's gonna add up to something like Close Encounters of the Third Kind or something really large. But then it kind of snaps you back, oh yeah, kids film. But... Heck, there's nothing wrong with that. Just because it did one element of the film way too well doesn't mean that the second half is gonna be anything really that bad. That's Paul Rubens as Max, and he does a really good job playing both the very serious stern computer and also the sort of fun-loving goofy side. That part gets injected into him when he scans Davy's brain. If I did have a problem, I'd say that the kid himself is a little bit of a wimp. I get the feeling the part was written for a younger role, like maybe 6 or 7, but this kid looks somewhere between 11 and 13, and I don't know, I just don't see an 11 or 13 year old crying this much, or whining this much, or being this afraid. Wouldn't he be at that age where he wants to get these answers, he wants to know what's going on? 
But aside from that, this film is great. It has wonderful buildup, it has a really fun second half, it's got some damn good effects, and it balances out with just enough ideas and intrigue with fun and goofiness. I can see people being turned off by having a much better, stronger half than a second half, but if you go in remembering that this was a movie mostly intended for families, I think you'll enjoy it fine. Find out for yourself as you are the Navigator. Yet another film that got panned for being too scary, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. And yeah, again, I'm not gonna act like I don't see where they're coming from. Everything in this movie is huge, gigantic, and trying to kill you. It's totally understandable. But again, I think a lot of critics really underestimate how much kids could take because this movie was a big hit and audiences loved it. Not only did it have a lot of impressive sets and some damn good effects at the time, but it had some funny side characters and okay cast of main characters. It was a great big budget version of something that we've seen plenty of times before, but not quite to the scale. Rick Moranis is a scientist who's trying to create a machine that, you guessed it, can shrink things. But everything he tries to shrink down keeps blowing up in his face, literally. But that all changes when the neighbor's kid accidentally knocks a baseball into the machine, which figures out was the missing element. So both the neighbor's kids and the scientist's kids all get shrunken down. They get taken out with the trash, and all they have to do is cross the backyard in order to get home. Only now, the backyard is a jungle. They come across everything. Bees, ants, lawnmowers, sprinklers. Everyday little mundane things are now psychotic killers trying to destroy them. When I was a kid, I really enjoyed this film, and even today, I do find I like it, but nowadays I find I enjoy more the technicals of it, like the sets, or the animatronics, or the stop motion, things like that. The story and characters aren't bad, they're just kind of okay. With the exception of maybe Rick Moranis and Matt Frewer as the neighbors. The kids are kind of generic kids, you got your geeky little dweeb, you have the jock, you have the pretty girl, you have the pretty boy, of course they're gonna fall in love. It's fine, I mean, I can't think of anything that was really painful to go through. I guess I would have liked a little bit more, though. But again, that's not the focus. The focus is the effects. That's pretty much how the story is told. Characters walk, talk a bit, then they come across an effect. Characters talk, walk a bit, then they come across an effect. And it's fine, that's what most kids want to see, and I guess that's what most adults want to see, too. But in terms of character, I did find I enjoyed the stuff with Rick Moranis and the neighbors a lot more. That's where the main comedy seemed to come from. Everything else sort of falls into the wouldn't it be neat category. Not that these characters are bad, but you don't care as much what happens to them as much as, hey, wouldn't it be cool if I was there? I want to eat that giant cookie, I want to ride that giant ant, I want to do all this stuff. Except maybe the stuff that's trying to kill you, that we could skip. So overall, it's an okay film with some really cool effects in it. If the effects weren't there, it'd probably be a bit of a bore, but they are, and they're impressive, and the story leads to a lot of great grand effects, and they're fun to check out. Some scenes can be a little intense for younger kids, but again, nothing bloody, nothing really that terrifying. It's just intense. Check it out for yourself, and find out. Wow, how did Disney let that title get by? I remember every kid who read that title was like, holy shit, Disney did what? But that's not the kind of story they're telling. When they say blow up, they mean make bigger. And that's what the film is about. Rick Moranis is back and so is his son. The sister, I guess, is in college or off screen land. And they have yet another newcomer to welcome. A little baby boy that gets wound up in his latest invention and, as you guess, grows larger. Only they can't seem to control it, and he just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger until he's Godzilla size. Can our parents figure out a way to save him before the military shoots him down? Oh, what do you think? Once again, the movie is definitely a showcase for some impressive effects that, even nowadays, still hold up pretty well. And I get the feeling that the first film probably got a lot of complaints from parents saying, oh, too many scary images, oh, too intense, because this one is the complete opposite. Everything is really happy, everything is really cute. Oh, look at the little baby, now he's big and he's running a rampage, tee hee ha ha. Oh, he bit the ice cream bar, cute. And that's sort of the attitude this one has. Really goofy and really childish, but 
listen to the setup, what do you expect? The first film was already a little silly with its concept, but this one is especially silly. There's a lot of over-the-top acting, there's a lot of cutesy humor, and again, it's fine. You can show it to your kids and they can get some laughs, but as an adult, I think outside of some of the effects, it's not going to be as impressive. Where with the first one, it was creating an entire world and weird creatures and all sorts of strange things to come across. Here, they just made a baby big. And they did it well, don't get me wrong, but after a while, it kind of wears off and is not as interesting as the first one. But I guess it could have been a lot worse. Rick Moranis is still funny. The kid has grown up and is no longer a dweeby scientist, but instead wants to be a rock musician, which is odd. There's a baby Sarah that gets roped into it, literally. And like I said, there's one or two funny visuals with it. But it's nowhere as interesting as the first one, and it is one of those sequels that really didn't need to exist. But if you're interested and you just want to show your kid a little something that's kind of funny and has some neat effects, it's not bad to check out. But for anyone that really enjoyed the world and the size of the first one, this film will definitely leave you wanting something bigger. Yet another film that got a lot of people talking about it when it first came out, and then just sort of disappeared. The Rocketeer, a superhero of the 40s that finds a rocket pack and is using it to try and stop Nazis. Well, okay, it's a little better than I'm making it sound. The more appropriate way to talk about it is, Cliff is our hero and he discovers a rocket pack that was hidden in his place. Him and his friend, played by Alan Arkin, test it out and it turns out they really enjoy it, and they want to keep trying it. But when a pilot loses control of his plane, it's up to him to save the day, and sure enough, now they got a hero on their hands. But an evil villain, played by Timothy Dalton, is an actor in Hollywood who's actually a spy for the Nazis. They want to use the rocket pack to take over the world by flying around and being unstoppable. Yeah, not the most probable weapon of war, but eh, it's fantasy. Things get worse when they kidnap his girlfriend Jenny, played by Jennifer Connelly, and of course he has to go to take down entire army, giant monster, thugs, and a huge blimp in order to save her. The film definitely has a feel of the 40s, which I think is kind of welcomed. The same guy who directed this also directed Captain America, and it shows they both sort of have the same feel to them. Even the hero is kind of similar. And speaking of people in this movie, this one has a lot of big names that were not yet big names. But one of the reasons I really like this film is that while you're watching it, you're saying to yourself, these people should be big names. Because they're all wonderful performers and they do a great job portraying these parts. The only one that never went on to anything was the Rocketeer himself, and I feel kind of bad. I thought actually he was a pretty legit lead. I don't know, maybe the part just wasn't written complex enough for him to shine, but I thought he actually did okay. The effects probably use a little too much of the green screen technology, but there's still lots of scenes of him flying around on his own too. Is there a lot of action in terms of punching and firing guns and stuff? Not really until the end, most of it is just watching him fly around, but like I said, these characters are really likable, and there's sort of a good mystery to it as well. It has a lot of dark gritty moments, but it has a lot of lighthearted fun also. I get the feeling this film was sort of trying to be a more kid-friendly Indiana Jones, and yeah, that's kind of what you get. Like I said, there are still one or two gruesome deaths in there, but nothing along the lines of Harrison Ford territory. My guess is maybe that's why it didn't quite catch on. I think people probably did want to see him punch out a few more people or see a little bit more of a badass, but I don't know, for a basic action adventure, I think it's fine. It's creative, it's funny, it's got its dark elements, it's got a fun villain, it's got some fun side characters. I don't think it's grand, but I think it's good. I don't know, if something like Captain America can be released and do okay, I think this one should get the same treatment. So go check it out and make its popularity soar again. Who doesn't remember the Mighty Ducks, the team of screw-ups that nobody thought had a chance but with the use of a certain coach who doesn't think he'll fit in but then finds the strength to stand by his team, they will go to the finals and oh, come on. Even before this story was used over and over and over again, it was already tired. Which is a shame because there's nothing in Mighty Ducks that's especially bad, but there's nothing that's especially good in it either. 
Emilio Estevez plays a rich man who gets in trouble, so he's been sentenced to having to coach a Little League hockey team. And of course, they're all troublemakers and goofy and wacky, and at first, his plan is to win games simply by having them call fouls. Yeah, anytime they're tapped, he wants them to fall down and fake these injuries. That's actually pretty funny. But one kid simply won't do it and says that he wants to fight because he loves the sport and he loves what he does. Estevez thinks maybe he should start doing the same thing and tries to encourage the kids to be stronger. And of course, through determination and hard work, they all come together and yeah, sometimes they fall off the wagon, but they get right back on because they love their coach and they love their team and they make it to the big playoffs and all that good stuff. What can I say about this movie that hasn't been said about every single movie that has this plot? I guess it kind of did it early on, but didn't we have Bad News Bears and a few other films before it? I think people saw it because the cast of kids they have were actually pretty good and pretty entertaining, but they weren't written that way, they were more acted that way. They had the silly faces, they had the goofy performances, and yeah, kids are gonna like that. And for a lot of younger people, this is the first time they're seeing this story. And like I said before, there's nothing really bad in it. I mean, it fills up the time fine, there's some atmospheric moments, I do like it when Estevez goes to see his old coach. But you just gotta like this formula and this setup if you're gonna like this film, and I don't. I thought it was tired and boring the first time I saw it, and I think it's tired and boring now. Even the sequels, which I'm not gonna review by the way, because it'd be like reviewing the same movie over and over, are pretty much the same, except insert laziness with something else. Like in the second one, it was fame. They let fame go to their head, and now they have to get back in training. And in the third one, camaraderie and teamwork starts to fall apart, and it's just not worth it. Looking back on it years later, I just find it as a huge bore. Really tell me at the beginning of this movie you don't know scene for scene what's gonna happen. And is there really anything that hilarious to keep you connected to it? I remember when I saw it as a kid, I liked it, but once. And I didn't really get why everybody had to buy this movie and have it in their collection. And nowadays our generation knows this story about the sports team that has to be built up and will somehow succeed as the Mighty Ducks story, but even before Mighty Ducks this story was around, and even before it existed it was still kind of boring. If you like it, great, but I never got into these stories and I don't think I ever will. I know a lot of people like it, but personally, I couldn't give a puck. Isn't the term based such a great word, as in, this is based on a true story? Cool Runnings definitely exploited that word when it was telling the story of Olympic Jamaicans who actually made it into a bobsledding competition. I get the feeling this film could have been a really dramatic, really fascinating story if it was done by like Touchstone or Paramount or something. But because it's Disney, we gotta play out the goofy and funniness of these guys trying to make it in the Winter Olympics. And would the film have been better if it didn't deal with that corny point of view? Probably, but at the same time, I kinda like the corny point of view in this. Yeah, I'm really torn about this, because on the one hand, it is silly, and the Jamaicans are more like the Ninja Turtles and their personalities and how colorful and goofy they are. But at the same time, I kinda like the Ninja Turtles, and oh, let's look at the story. A Jamaican wants to run in the Olympics, but when an accident happens, literally tripping him up, it looks like his chances are gone forever, until he finds out there's another way to get in through bobsledding. There's only two problems. One, they're in Jamaica, and nobody can do bobsledding. And two, he doesn't even know what a bobsled is. But, as luck would have it, an old drunken bobsledder, played by John Candy, happens to be in the neighborhood. And they keep pestering him and pestering him until he finally agrees that he'll try to train them. They get a team together, do their best to try and learn how to do it on Hills Without Ice, and sure enough, John Candy says they're ready to go. When they get to the Olympics, of course, everybody laughs and mocks them and thinks they can't go anywhere. And at first, they don't. They start to choke. But then on the second go, they start to actually do a really good job and everybody is suddenly on their side. All building up to the final competition. 
As a kid, I love this movie. I love how goofy everybody does. I love how colorful they were. I love how they all had distinct personalities. I love how they had their own little backstories, like one wanted to live in Buckingham Palace, even though he wasn't aware it was Buckingham Palace. But as an adult, wait, one wanted to live in Buckingham Palace, even though he didn't know it was Buckingham Palace? What? You got bullies in this movie that are played by the Germans, which, yeah, on the one hand is kind of funny and how silly it is, but on the other hand, really? The ending, which I won't give away, is actually a very heartfelt and inspiring ending, but yeah, even that goes a little too corny. It's just, I don't know, there's a very fine line of an audience that will like this movie. You have to be ready for that corniness. You have to be ready for the slow clap and the dramatic turn and the really corny, goofy moments with the really corny, goofy music playing. And okay, let's say you're not a fan of that. Is there anything in this film that's redeemable? Well, once again, as with practically any role that he's in, John Candy is fantastic. Every time you see this guy on screen, you always shout, man, did he leave too soon. Why didn't we appreciate him more when he was around? He just took every role that he did so seriously, whether it was a comedy or a drama or something in between like this. He captures the pain and weight of a guy who cheated in the Olympics originally, but then wanted to come back. He wanted to do it because he felt it was right and he wanted to give other people a chance. He wanted to do it because that's what the Olympics are. And you hear that in every breath that he takes. But aside from that, is the film worth checking out? I guess it's sort of like Disney's The Hunchback of Notre Dame. If you can accept that Disney is above the title and that the actual story it's based on is not going to be represented that well, you can still find a relatively entertaining movie. Even if there are a lot, and I mean a lot, of corny Disneyisms. But to all the actors' credit, they do what they need to do pretty well when they need to have the funny moments, they're pretty funny and over the top, and when they need to have the dramatic moments, they do that fine too. Are the side stories really forced and contrived? Yes. Did they probably not happen? Most likely. But you do get a lot of heart from these guys, and you can definitely feel it on screen. So, it's definitely a mixed bag. For me, the film is harmless, and allowed for some fun humor and even a few inspiring moments, even if they are really corny. It's kind of like those old 80s movies that you watch that you know are really hokey, but you can't help but enjoy because there's just so much passion behind it. I think it's sort of the same case here. I think that should give you a general idea if this is a film you're going to enjoy or not. And even though the silliness of it can be a little teeth grinding at times, I can't find myself saying I didn't actually enjoy it. I did. I enjoy the cheesy lines, I enjoy the annoying one-liners, and I enjoy it because there's still a lot of heart behind it. Yeah, there's a lot of fault, but in my heartfelt nostalgic mind, there's no problem on it. See, it's so corny it's even having me say lines like that. Hey kids, feeling awkward because you're a teenager and you haven't had sex yet? Well, according to Disney, you should! At least, that's the lesson of Hocus Pocus. A movie starring Bette Midler as a leader of witches who were axed off years ago. But a boy and his sister bring them back to life by accidentally saying a spell, and now they're looking to take over the town and of course, run amok. With the help of a would-be girlfriend, a boy who was cursed to the body of a cat, and even a walking zombie, our heroes have to see if they can stop the witches in time. Okay, so I'm just gonna get to what I really fucking hate about this movie the most. It's strange obsession that if you're a teenager and you're a virgin, there's something wrong with you. Yeah, this is Disney. I mean, yeah, I know your whole sex is bad, but we're actually using sex to sell stuff is always kind of there, but oh my god, you're not supposed to be this insulting with it, or this direct. The main character in this movie admits that he hasn't had sex, and everybody, I mean freaking everybody, has a heart attack about it. It's practically the focus of the movie. Hell, even the finishing line centers around it. And don't get me wrong, I'm not one of those prudes that thinks like teenagers should never talk about sex and they should all live in happy places where sex doesn't exist or weird shit like that, but this movie puts a lot of emphasis on if you haven't had sex yet, you're a loser and you should be made fun of and this is the way the world works. Yeah, Disney has kind of turned into that big obnoxious bully at school. 
And it's such a weird thing for something like Disney to focus on. Every time it's brought up, I just feel kind of dirty. But taking that incredibly distracting element out of it, how is the rest of the movie? I don't know, it didn't do that much for me either. I mean, there are some creative elements, like the look of it is kind of neat, and there's some fun, goofy Halloween stuff going on. But it's just kind of a bland story that works into the typical fish-out-of-water jokes. The main characters are bland, the side characters look neat, but don't really have that much of a personality either. The only thing that does stand out is the performances of the witches themselves. They don't have much to work with, but by god, they still work with it. These are three very funny ladies trying to make material that's not very funny into something that's funny. Just look at how quick they are, look at their facial expressions, look how big they get their eyes and mouths, and yeah, they're really having fun here. I guess on that level the film is kind of enjoyable, but again, I said they're not really given much to work with, and that still stands. As energetic and silly as they can make their performances, it still doesn't save a bad script. I don't care if you give them song sequences, I don't care if you have them ride vacuums, you're still not technically saying anything that's very funny. Which is a shame, I think this idea could have worked, I mean these are three very funny actresses and the idea of three witches now being resurrected in current time, that could be kind of fun. But a bland script makes it predictable and not very interesting, and all that virgin talk escalates into a series of uncomfortable, awkward moments. I just never quite got or understood it. It's one of the most bizarre focuses a movie has ever had in terms of Disney. So yeah, as you can tell, not a big fan. Even though I know these actresses are doing their best, it's still boring, it's still predictable, and it's still uneasy. I don't know, if you want the whole teen sex thing done in a much funnier, better way, I'd say either go watch a John Hughes film or Malcolm in the Middle. But personally, I would keep kids away from this like the plague. Seriously, what is your deal? What do you get when you combine Tim Curry, Kiefer Sutherland, Charlie Sheen, Chris O'Donnell, Oliver Platt, and that guy with a cool voice whose name you can never remember in one movie? A film a lot of people barely remember. But you know what? That's kind of a shame. Because I think this is actually a pretty legitimately fun action film. It has sword fights, it has romance, it has conspiracies, it has a villain. And it's all in that over-the-top 90s cheese that we've all grown to love. But nostalgia is one thing. Is it actually good? Well, let's take a look at the story. Chris O'Donnell is D'Artagnan, and he's looking to join the Musketeers, a group of people that are hired to protect the king. But the Musketeers have been disbanded by the Order of the Cardinal, played by Tim Curry. Why? So he can have the newly crowned king assassinated so that he may take the throne. There's only three Musketeers who didn't listen to the rules, and now they're banned as outlaws. So D'Artagnan decides to join them so that, well, let's be honest, they can form their own boy band. Yeah, I mean, look at now, you got the heartfelt one, the funny one, the serious one, and the emo all the girls can't help but love because, oh, I just want to hug him. And I guess in some ways you can attribute that to the film's biggest problem, that, yeah, it is pretty cliché. And on top of that, there's a lot of characters, and so they try to fit a lot of stories with, well, a lot of the traditional clichés in there. But in my opinion, they're such fun clichés, and they lead to a really fun movie. Aren't you just waiting for that moment when Chris O'Donnell is talking about love and inevitably you know Kiefer Sutherland is just gonna say, Love! Ha! Let, Let me, me tell, tell you a story, story about love. love. Don't you just love it when Oliver Platt is trying to create a quote that could sound similar to God I love being a turtle? God I love my work. And five words. Tim Curry as the villain. Oh my god, I'm surprised there's any scenery left behind him. He's chewed so much. He does all the typical, over-the-top Tim Curry stuff we expect Tim Curry to do. He smiles, he looks slimy, he stretches out his vowels. He screams, he yells, he raises his eyebrows. Oh my god, it's Tim Curry as the villain, and that should give you an idea what kind of movie this is. But aside from that, the action's not bad either, as well as the comedy. I think possibly the major problem the film falls into is, well, we've kind of seen this stuff before, and we've kind of seen this formula before. The only thing that really sets it apart, again, is sort of the cheese factor and its passion. But I don't think that's a bad thing. On top of that, like I said, there are a lot of characters, and to the film's credit, they tried to give every single character a backstory or a love interest, and good for them, they're not passing over anybody. 
But at the same time, it's a lot to juggle, and you kind of forget which tragic love story we're in, or who loved who, and... I mean, it's not terribly confusing, but it's still a lot. Maybe there's a part of me that wants to like it more, because I really felt like, for the time, they were giving exactly what audiences want to see. This is the kind of action film people liked watching. It didn't take any big risks, and yeah, it was safe and marketable. Does that make it a great action film? No, but at the same time, I think the stunts it does have, and the comedy, and the attention to the characters, does still make it a decent flick. In that, yeah, there's a lot to make fun of, but there's also a lot to have fun with. If you're looking for an action film to pass the test of time and have a lot of subtlety to it, this one probably isn't it. But if you're looking for something that's just kind of fun, kind of cheesy, has some good action, some good character, just a fun little adventure as opposed to a big grand epic, then I think this is worth checking out. Yeah, a lot of it is standard and we've seen it before, but it's just the right amount of over the top. Never to the point where it's insultingly bad, but just the right amount where you're kind of giggling but having fun with it too. It's seriously overlooked and I think deserves a lot more attention. It's all for fun and fun for all. So at the time the Santa Claus came out, there was actually a little bit of a risk factor to it, in that nobody knew if Tim Allen could actually carry a film. We knew he could carry a sitcom okay, but that was sort of the standard formula that was repeated over and over, and yeah, does that translate well into not only a theatrical film, but a Christmas film? And the answer is yes, he does, but not as much the story. Which is a good setup, but doesn't give much else on top of it. The movie centers around Tim Allen being a divorced dad with a son. He's trying to find a way to spend more time with him around Christmas, and, sure enough, he accidentally yells at Santa Claus who's on top of his roof, causing him to lose his footing and, yes, kill himself. Pretty dark, actually. Trying to make his son feel better, he takes off the suit and puts it on, not realizing that he's actually entering into the Santa Claus. With an E. Get it? So now he has the job of delivering all the gifts to all the kids around the world. He tries to decline it, but over time, he seems to keep putting on weight, growing long hair, and yes, even a white beard. Eventually he finds he just can't turn away and decides to take the job. All while his son starts telling everybody, and of course they don't believe him, and then he's roped in, and then nobody believes him, but of course they'll be proven wrong in the end, and god I hate these stories. If it was more funny, I'd be more open to it, but that's one of its major problems. It's not that funny. Now, to the film's credit, I don't think it's trying to be that funny. I think it's trying to be more whimsical and magical, and it does have certain elements of that. The North Pole is a lot of fun, it definitely has some decent effects. There is certainly this idea that they want to give the size and weight to Santa, while also throwing in a little comedy, but again, the key words are little comedy. When you have Tim Allen as Santa Claus, you know you want a lot of funny stuff, and they don't really do that much. It's more trading it in for this story of him trying to convince everyone he's Santa Claus, nobody believing him, and then people getting more concerned, and just, ah, you know where it's gonna go, so why are we watching it? Well, maybe a few reasons are that Tim Allen's not bad. He definitely has a charm factor to him, and to help him out, he has some enjoyable elves as well. I found interesting that in this rendition, the elves are played by kids, not little people. And they're still supposed to be older, like some are several hundred years old, but they look like little kids. I guess that's their way of getting past child labor laws. At first I was somewhat offended by this because I thought, hey, isn't that kind of taking jobs away from little people by having kids acted instead? But the more I thought about it, the North Pole does look a little bit more jolly with a bunch of kids running around. And yeah, I know they're not really kids in this, but come on, they're kids. And they're happy and they're cheerful, and yeah, it just makes the place seem more upbeat. Which is not to say grown adults in the role aren't upbeat, but you can't capture it like you can with a kid. So I think it's fine, especially knowing that the majority of elf roles are still going to have little people in them. The North Pole is a nice looking North Pole. It's very bright and colorful and definitely has a large scale to it. And yeah, it's obviously a set, but I don't mind. It still has sort of that magical element to it. But is there enough magic in this movie to overlook a painfully obvious story? In my opinion, no. But for a lot of other people, yes. If you can put up with that kind of story and don't really mind it, then there's still plenty of other elements on top of it to be enjoyable. Just not enough for me to get into it. It's not the worst, it's just kind of boring for me. But again, if it doesn't bother you, then I think this film will be a fun, magical ride. I just think there's more that can be explored and done with this idea. But hey, that's what we have sequels for, and I'll join you over in the next video for those. Well, 
looks like I'm the only one who couldn't get into the original Santa Claus movie as they made not one, but two sequels to this film, both with Tim Allen reprising the role. How do they hold up? Well, I guess like the first Santa Claus, there's some elements that are really magical, unique, and nice, while other moments are painfully predictable and extremely boring, and, well, do they balance out? Well, that depends which one you're looking at. In Santa Claus 2, The Mrs. Claus, Tim Allen has to find himself a wife and get married, or else all the powers of Santa Claus will disappear. And of course, being typical Disney, he only has a month to do it and convince her to marry him. Uh-huh. Shit like that makes this really stupid. But what makes it good are some really genuinely romantic elements. And yes, it's still done in a month, and that's weird, but if you look at everything else as kind of this first date and just a couple slowly falling in love, then actually it's not that bad. He tries courting a principal at a school that at first he thinks is really cold-hearted, but the more he talks to her, the more he realizes that there's actually more to her than he thought. And their chemistry, I think, is totally believable and really charming, and leads to a lot of very nice romantic moments. But guess where it leads? That's right, he has to tell the truth about who he is, she gets angry and doesn't believe him, and it all starts over again. We saw it in the first film, it wasn't good then, why are we watching it again? But to the movie's credit, there's a subplot about a robot Santa who is taking over the North Pole, and it's surprisingly really funny. Let me rephrase that. It's so awkwardly acted that you can't help but find it funny. And I don't know if that was intentional or not, but it actually does get a giggle out of me. But then you gotta sit through another subplot about his son being put on the naughty list, which really you don't need. You could have cut this and everything would have been fine. And he also had to sit through some incredibly unfunny moments where Tim Allen seems like a jerk and is really annoying, but then at other times he seems really charming and really nice, and at other moments the comic relief can be really funny, at other moments they can be really not funny, and oh, it's just all over the place. But for me though, I at least give the movie credit that's trying something different. For the most part. There's another clause and there's another mission, but at the same time, we see more of the North Pole, and we see some really nice Christmassy moments, and we see Santa Claus actually being really charming, and yeah, Tim Allen actually is turning out to be a very unique kind of Santa Claus. It's still Tim Allen, but yeah, he sort of gives it his own spin. So I did find myself actually liking it enough, because yeah, there's enough unique things to it. The third one, on the other hand, is a bit of a different story. This one's called The Escape Clause, and we have Martin Short come in as Jack Frost, who's trying to totally dethrone Santa and take over his job. Well, that's all fine and good, but we have a subplot where his wife wants to bring her parents up, but they can't because they don't think they can keep a secret, so they try to convince them that it's Canada. Well, okay, that's kind of funny, that can work, but then we have yet another subplot with her about to give birth, and yet another subplot about him being too busy, and yet another subplot that's combining like three different movies where he goes back in time, and it's like he never existed as Santa, and what does that mean? So we sort of have Back to the Future, and it's a wonderful life, and the other other Santa Claus movies and any other movie you can throw in here that's not entirely original. There's still some strong elements, like I enjoy how a lot of the machines making the toys break down, so he has to make the bits of the toys that are still around into one other toy, a brand new toy that's actually pretty cool. Again, it's showcasing how the Tim Allen personality could actually make an okay Santa Claus. But the parents are miserable characters, most of the time is just spent with people being unhappy, not getting many laughs, even Martin Short is really underplayed in his comedy. But the designs are still really nice, and I really enjoy these enchanted side characters like the Easter Bunny and Father Time and stuff like that. They were a good addition in the second film, and they make much more of an appearance here, and I really like them. But for me, there's just not enough fun to it, or comedy. So, yeah, on the whole, I actually would kind of recommend the second one if you can get through some of the bullshit, but the third one just has too much bullshit for me. I give credit that they tried to do something new with the idea and at least try to evolve it. And when it works, it's great. But when it doesn't, it's a pretty awkwardly annoying Christmas. But hell, if you're a Christmas junkie like me, you're gonna see it anyway. So check it out and draw your own conclusion. So at the time when they were making live-action movies out of any dumb old cartoon, yeah, I know, as opposed to today, George of the Jungle was the one that everyone thought was gonna be the biggest flop. And who can blame them? It's not like there was a ton to go off of with the original cartoon. And the past live-action films based on cartoons have been so bad, this clearly had no chance. 
but with an upbeat, innocent sense of humor and an upbeat, innocent main character, as well as upbeat, innocent side characters, George of the Jungle is a lot of fun. Is it Die Hard hilarious? No, but as kids' movies go, this has a lot of stuff about it that's pretty unique. Ursa and her fiancé are on an exposition into the jungle. At some point, they get separated, and she comes across a wild man named George, played by Brendan Fraser. This is obviously a Tarzan knockoff, but it has a few other twists to it. For example, he doesn't really have a pet dog like most people has, he has a pet elephant. Yet, strangely enough, it still acts like a dog. And not only can he communicate with the apes, but the apes can communicate with people. In fact, they're kind of geniuses. One of them voiced by John Cleese. Ursa wants to show George the human world, and George wants to show Ursa the ape world. And we find out that the fiancé is actually a bad guy, and he has this evil plan, and oh, it doesn't matter. And I don't mean that in an insulting way, I mean that in the way that literally the film doesn't care much either. The narrator keeps interrupting that it's all fake, it's all a film, and it's here for jokes, and yeah, it sort of works that way, and it works well. It sort of has its own kid-friendly, unique sense of humor. And the devotion all the actors have to being silly throughout the entire thing but still totally committed is actually kind of charming. There's something nice about the fact that it knows it's a kid's movie and it's gonna have fun with it and it's not gonna try and be badass and make the kids older. No, it's just gonna try and be smart and, for lack of a better word, cute. It is a cute movie and I think a lot of people forget that you can do cute movies okay. Not everything has to have a ton of references, or swear words, or really harsh action, or these dark backstories. You know what? Sometimes you can just have a fun, dumb comedy that can actually be smart in its dumbness. And it can be child-friendly. It's kind of like if the Zucker Brothers or Mel Brooks did a kid's film. It's the same amount of effort, except it's put into something that's family-friendly. Now, as I said before, not every joke works. In fact, there's a lot that really die and don't go anywhere, and you sort of say to yourself, yeah, you could have cut that. But shortly after, you see about five other jokes that do work, and you kind of forget about them. And the actors, as well as the narrator, are so good at carrying you from one joke to another that it just feels like fun. You don't want to rate every joke or judge the story or the pacing or anything. You just kind of sit back and enjoy it. And that's the kind of experience I had. I don't think it's a big staple for comedy or anything, but for a movie that clearly should have been dead on arrival, it's actually very enjoyable. Kids love it, adults seem to like it, what's not to enjoy? I mean, aside from that catchy-ass theme song that'll never leave your head. Nah, screw it, I enjoy that too. George, George, George of the Jungle, friend to you and me! Uh, I hope you guys appreciate what I do for you. This is The Princess Diaries, and if you couldn't guess, I didn't see this when it came out in theaters, but it's disney December, so I was kind of hoping maybe this would be that little surprise that caught me off guard, and it's not. All right, let's look at the story. Anne Hathaway is a really nerdy girl who just wants to disappear and be invisible. But suddenly her grandmother, who never visits, played by Julie Andrews, comes in and reveals that in fact she is a queen and that through some complicated bloodline, Anne Hathaway is in fact a princess, and that by blood, she's the only one who can take over ruling. Hathaway, of course, doesn't want the position and just wants to disappear, but Julie Andrews thinks that the more she can talk to her and the more that she can convince her, the more she'll come around to taking the post or else it's gonna be handed over to an evil guy who wants to do bad things with it, probably. I don't know, we never exactly figure out his politics, but he looks bad, so I'm sure it's gonna be bad. What follows is, of course, every cliché you can think of in this setup. The scenes where they have to act all elegant and she screws up. The visual jokes. The scenes where she has to act like she's princessy, but ooh, slapstick is gonna happen. The kid and the grandmother aren't gonna get along, but over time they will learn from one another and they'll find out all sorts of neat things. And just when you think they're gonna get along, all of a sudden something happens to throw a wrench into the works and they think they hate each other, but then of course they come around and oh, you've heard that story before? Don't worry, there's about a million other cliches you've heard before. Including the idiot bad boy she wants to date, even though there's a perfectly good boy that wants to date her, but of course she doesn't realize it. The nerdy best friend that of course she's gonna betray. The bully that never says anything real bullies do, or does anything real bullies do. The goof up she's gonna have that somehow don't really goof up anything, and everyone's still happy when she takes the position. I think the only thing missing is the actual political talk. Yeah, if she's gonna rule a king Kingdom, shouldn't she, you know, know about the kingdom and shouldn't she know about politics? Shouldn't she be thrust into this? No, it's more important to have her wave properly or wear the correct dresses and, ah, uh, sheesh. 
The director of this movie is Gary Marshall, who I've seen in interviews and is a great producer and I'm sure is very nice, but god, I don't think I've seen one movie from him that I've liked. He kinda does for the female audience what, say, Vin Diesel does for the male audience. Yeah, we know it's stupid and it's really bad, but we kinda give it a pass cause, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we were in that situation? Well, I don't like a lot of Vin Diesel films and I don't like a lot of these films either. The formula is beyond tired and beyond predictable. You can guess every single moment that's going to happen. As I was watching it, I was pleading, pleading for it to give me something new, something I haven't seen before, something that makes it unique. And I guess if you want to get kind of specific, there is one thing that sort of makes it unique, and that's the performances. The majority of actors in this movie are trying their hardest to give a role that you haven't seen before, even though the role has been written millions of times. And to the credit, some of them kind of work. Like Julie Andrews does give her own very unique charm to the whole thing. While the role is not written well at all, she does in fact give it this certain dignity. Every single time she talks, you know that not only is she trying to connect with her daughter, but she's trying to be a politician. She's trying to balance everything out, and you hear the desperation in her voice to get this done. So I think she works out really well. I never quite got on the hate and Hathaway boat like a lot of our people did, I just never thought she picked very good movies. But as the nerdy girl she does okay, and as the pretty girl she does okay. There probably could have been an actress that could bring more to it, but at the same time, she has nothing to work with, and for what she did, I think it's pretty impressive. There's a head of security character we've seen a million times, but again, he does pretty well. There's a hair designer we've seen a million times, but again, this guy's acting is actually very funny. But even with all these people trying their hardest, they just can't make do with a story that is so damn recycled. And tropes that have been drilled into the ground, and those goddamn musical moments where you just want to go, Oh, how inspiring, how whimsical, I just want to puke all over the damn screen on her pretty little dress. I guess if you're looking for a movie that is just the straightforward Cinderella story and you want to pretend yourself as the pretty girl being made up, Eh, it's still kind of bad. But if you're just going in for pure fantasy and you're unbelievably forgiving, I guess this film is for you. Anyone else? I say this is a diary you can definitely skip. Well, you all know what I thought of the first Princess Diaries, and now we have the sequel. And, I have to say, it totally took me by surprise. I don't think I've laughed so hard in such a long, long time. Oh, not because the writing's any good, not because the acting's any good, on the contrary. All those elements are absolutely horrendously awful, resulting in an absolutely hilarious piece of shit. That's right, it's one of those so bad it's good movies. You wouldn't think that with Disney, this would be the franchise to warrant such a distinction. But man, it's not only bad, it's nostalgia critic bad. I mean, I'm seriously thinking about putting this on the list someday. The story is Anne Hathaway is almost hitting 21, which means she's gonna be queen soon. But a bad guy, played by John Reese davies wants to take the throne from her. How do I know? Because he literally announces it. You should be more careful, your royal highness. Somebody might try to take that away from you. Someone like me. And on top of that, everyone, I mean friggin' everyone announces it in the movie too, like it was made for four-year-olds. Would you please try to keep up, Brigitte? He's trying to steal the crown. But wait, it gets better. So all the parliament decides that in order for Anne Hathaway to become a queen, she has to marry. How does she know this? Because she finds a secret passage that is so obviously labeled, it's so impossible for it to be called a secret passage. But it gets better. So they literally invite the villains to stay with them in their palace. Why? Because they want to keep their enemies close. So close that they could sabotage everything, which is exactly what they do. But wait, it gets better. So the son of the guy who's trying to take over falls in love with the princess. And they do that cliche where they do nothing but bicker and yell at each other, yet you know they're gonna get together. Yet they forgot to put in any element of them actually liking each other. Look at this scene. They're yelling and saying how much they hate one another, and then they just kiss. Where the hell did that come from? I loathe you. I loathe you. Mm. We've seen that cliche before, but there usually has to be something about them that they have in common or they like. And here, there's nothing. They're just forced right into it. 
the wait, it gets better. Now that she's going to become queen in literally 30 days, not only does she have to find someone to marry, but do you think now they're finally going to talk about the politics and the importance of her kingdom and touring it and stuff? No, they have more important things like learning how to wave their fans and having slumber parties. That's right, the fate of their whole nation could crumble in the matter of days and yet they're going mattress surfing! Oh, the fate of your country doesn't matter when you can be having song sequences with Raven! And it just gets stupider and stupider and stupider. I am thoroughly convinced that this movie, even though it has a PG rating and even though it's marketed to preteens, teens, and even some adults, would only be enjoyed by kindergartners. It is literally written for kindergartners. Sophia the First has more dignity and intelligence than this film. And I enjoyed it from beginning to end. It is that horrendously bad it's good. So, yeah, in a strange way, I kind of recommend it. If you're looking for one of those movies that mocks every cliché and every horrifying storytelling element without it even realizing it's doing it, then this movie is for you. I can understand someone saying it's just a cliché, boring piece of crap that there is nothing actually so bad it's good in it, but man, it was full of it for me. This movie brought me so much joy. God bless you, you horrible, horrible film. Every time I do one of these themed months, I always come across a pleasant surprise that I didn't see coming. And this month, it was definitely Holes. This is a movie I remember a lot of people were talking about when they saw the trailers because I guess it was based on a popular book. But then when it was released, it just sort of came and went and nobody talked about it anymore. So I didn't really know what to expect out of it, nor had any idea what it was about. But thankfully, I found this was a very enjoyable, very smart, and very well-acted movie. Okay, what's the premise? A kid played by Shia LaBeouf is arrested because he apparently stole some shoes, though really it just dropped on his head. The shoes apparently belong to a sports star who is auctioning it off for charity, which gives the crime a much bigger sentence. He's given a choice. He can either do prison or this special kind of camp where they do nothing but dig holes, and apparently that's supposed to work on their, I don't know, teamwork or something. It's not quite sure why they're digging the holes. I mean, okay, let me put it this way. It's obvious these people that they clearly establish as the bad guys are doing it for some reason, but why anyone is actually going along with it is a bit of a puzzle, and yeah, I could even argue a bit of the problem with the movie. But if you can see past that, and I'll totally understand if somebody can't, there's a lot of colorful characters you get to know. It's funny because after watching The Princess Diaries and hearing kids so not talk the way that kids talk, it's nice to see a film that actually came much closer. At least in terms of a Disney film. You know these kids aren't gonna drop the F-bomb or say any swear words, but the way they deliver these lines is actually pretty convincing. It actually reminded me a lot of Goonies. There's sort of this real talk to the way they say everything. Much of the movie is just focusing on the connections that Shia LaBeouf makes with the other boys, which is really kind of refreshing. That's not to say there's not another story going on in that there is, of course, a reason that they are digging for the holes and they keep cutting back and forth in between these other stories and flashbacks, but the focus is still the relationship with all the other boys. So if the acting and the writing with them is not done very well, this could easily fall apart. But it is done very well, and for the most part, it's pretty convincing. Without giving too much away, there are cutaways to another story about their past, and this kind of curse that started with LeBeau's family also connecting to an outlaw, and... It's actually one of the few times where the flashbacks and the present story they're telling both work and are both very enjoyable. Whenever it cuts away, I never think to myself, oh, we have to go back to that story? No, I'm actually looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to what happens in every single one that they cut to. And that's very rare. There usually is one that I prefer more than the other, but here, it's perfectly balanced. That's John Voigt, Tim Blake Nelson, and Sigourney Weaver as the people who run the place, and they hit just the right amount of over the top. Not quite laughably bad, but just enough to be kind of intimidating and kind of silly. They hit just the right mark. If I did have a problem with the movie, I would say that the editing maybe isn't that hot. Like I said, there's a lot of cutaways in this film, and whenever it does cut away, it sort of happens out of nowhere, and they don't really segue. As the film progresses on, you get used to it, but yeah, it is kind of distracting, especially at the beginning. 
I will admit, when the film began, I was also really worried when I saw his father, played by Henry Winkler, who's working on some sort of formula that can make it so that feet don't stink anymore. Yeah, I was thinking to myself, are we really doing this kind of movie? But it's really quick, and the focus isn't on that. They're in it for a very short time. There'd usually be a lot more supernatural elements or a lot more action, but even the climax of the movie is not really that big. It's actually pretty subdued. But that's the perfect kind of tone the movie is going for, and it really, really works. All these actors, particularly the boys, do a great job, and I have no problem believing them whatsoever. And the backstories, like I said, are wonderful too. So, yeah, I can't really find that much to dislike about this movie. It's no great big grand epic, but it is a really legit good film. If you got the time, check it out. There's a lot of good things to dig up. When the poster for Pirates of the Caribbean came out, I heard everybody snickering and laughing. What, Johnny Depp is in this? Jerry Bruckheimer, the rock guy, is producing a Disney film? Come on. Things didn't get any better when the trailer came out and they saw how ridiculous Johnny Depp looked. Oh my god, he stooped to a new low. Are we supposed to take him seriously? Is he really doing this movie based on a ride? Man, Disney's out of ideas. But little did everybody know that next to Mickey Mouse and the Princess line, Pirates of the Caribbean would be one of the most profitable Disney franchises ever. It was a big hit at the box office, spawned tons of merchandise, and of course, sequel after sequel after sequel. So, how'd this movie that had so much going against it turn out to be one of Disney's biggest hits? Well, a lot of it does center around Depp, playing the infamous Jack Sparrow. He belonged to a group called the Pirates of the Black Pearl, which he used to lead but now is led by Jeffrey Rush. But the pirates got too greedy and stole some gold that apparently had a curse on it. Now, whenever the moonlight shines, they're revealed as dead skeletons, who can't feel anything that happens to them. This proves to be a big drag for them as they can't experience any of the pleasures of life, so they tried to get the curse lifted. And they think the answer lies in a young Kira Knightley, who is kidnapped and has to be saved by Orlando Bloom, who it turns out is the real key to get the curse lifted. Along with Johnny Depp's help, they steal some ships, get in sword fights, all sorts of cannon play, gun play, swinging around, all the yo-ho, yo-ho, a pirate's life for me stuff. When the film came out, people loved it. And the more and more they watched it on DVD, the more and more they noticed the little comedic bits here and there, and the more and more they just got into it. Nowadays it's sort of seen as this action masterpiece, but I don't know if i go that far. It is fun, and it is goofy, and it has a lot of fun action in it. Johnny Depp as Jack Sparrow is comedically over the top and gets a lot of good laughs. Orlando Bloom and Keira Knightley are sort of the straight people to bounce off of, but they do a pretty decent job. Jeffrey Rush, I think, was born to play a pirate. I mean, just look at him. He's yucking up every scene he's in, and he's loving every moment of it. And so are we. What helps the movie become so enjoyable is that it does have such a good sense of humor. And it's not all in-jokes with current speak. It's actually jokes that, well, would fit in that time period. Yeah, for the most part. You have to have quite the extension of disbelief to buy a lot of this, but hey, for Disney's Pirates of the Caribbean, I think that kind of goes without saying. So everybody went in with that mindset, and we're kind of pleasantly surprised at how much fun it was. If I did have a problem, it's that there's probably a couple too many winks at the audience, especially having it be a Disney film. For example, did you notice that Jonathan Price is dressed up as Captain Hook in the beginning? What's the point of that? There's one line where someone refers to the Little Mermaid. I guess that's a Disney joke. Honestly, there's probably more references to other Disney films than there is the actual ride in this flick. But part of the fun of it is it doesn't feel like something that was needlessly made just to attract people who know the ride. It actually is sort of its own story with its own unique feel to it, even if there are a few nods here and there. I don't think it's a grand scale masterpiece, but I don't think it's supposed to be either. I think it's supposed to be just sort of a fun swashbuckling adventure with a lot of good comedy and a lot of good laughs. And that's exactly what I got. For a film that everybody thought was going to tank, we were all really surprised. If you can buy how incredibly silly and over the top it's going to be, and again, with the title Disney's Pirates of the Caribbean, you kind of assume you're going to, I think you can have a lot of fun with it. The music's great, it looks great, it's acted great, it's a pirate's life, and it's definitely for me. So after the surprise success of the first film and how it seemed to keep getting more and more money, Disney decided to do the Lord of the Rings route and film its two sequels back to back. 
and then another one pointlessly followed too. The consensus seems to be that the first sequel is great, the second sequel is awful, and the third sequel is... Wait, there's a third one? Did I just see that? Boy, was that forgettable. I think I'm one of the few people that has sort of the same outlook on all of them, which is... Eh? All of them have some really good action and some fun adventure, but all of them also have a lot of pointless padding, are really drawn out, and have some incredibly confusing and also annoying moments. In Dead Man's Chest, we continue the adventures of Jack Sparrow as he goes up against Davy Jones, which is a really great design. But they also bring back Orlando Bloom and Kira Knightley. What's the point? Their story ended in the first one. We didn't need them back. And on top of that, they give them a lot of screen time and a lot of backstory, and nobody cares. They were great at leveling out the more serious and mellow moments in the first one, but that was it. They did their job. They didn't need to be brought back. And a lot about their story doesn't add up. For example, Orlando Bloom meets his father, and yet in the first film they keep saying how much they look alike. In fact, they keep confusing the two for each other. This is a image of old bootstrap Bill. Come back to all us. But look at these two. Do they look remotely alike? Would you confuse this guy for Orlando Bloom at any moment? Giant Depp is still fun as Jack Sparrow, but he's really overused. For example, there's this one scene where they have to save him from all these natives that are trying to eat him. Why? There's no reason for it. It doesn't connect to the story, and it goes on for like 20 minutes. Couldn't you cut that? The ending is also based on a cliffhanger where they have to go save Jack Sparrow, which takes up even more time in the next film. Again, it's totally pointless, and even then that doesn't quite match up. At the end of this film, they say they challenge death and go to the ends of the world to try and get him back, but then the next film they say they didn't really want him back, it was just for some sort of big cause. The pirate song is sung or some crap like that. It's so inconsistent. I feel like they really wanted to rip off Star Wars here, like the stuff with the natives was sort of like the Jabba the Hutt scene that went on too long, and that the little cliffhanger where they had to save one of the main heroes in between movies is like Empire Strikes Back. But hey, even in Star Wars, a lot of people said that Jabba scene went on way too long and was kind of pointless. And there was a lot more character and drama that was riding in the Star Wars films than there is in the Pirates films. But God knows, they try to shove this stuff in. Orlando Bloom has a lot of drama dedicated to him. Kira Knightley has a lot of drama dedicated to her. Even that guy that was chasing them in the first one, he's back and he partakes in this really big complicated story. And speaking of which, they are really complicated. There's like a ton of things going on in these films. I couldn't follow it, and I didn't care. All I wanted to see was some sword fighting, some good action, and some comedy. Isn't that what we got with the first one? Isn't that what we should expect from something called Pirates of the Caribbean? Well, in Dead Man's Chess, we did get a lot of that. One, it stopped trying to shove so many damn plot points in our faces. The characters still get some funny lines, there's a lot of good slapstick. There's a wonderfully choreographed fight scene involving a watermill wheel. But if this film was already kinda complicated, the third one gets really complicated. Shuffling in at almost three hours with so many plot threads, so many characters not needed. And it being so needlessly dark and confusing and weird and just not that much fun. Again, when the comedy is there and the sword fighting and all that good stuff, it's fine. But I just don't get this idea of trying to turn it into this big grand epic. I mean, sweet Jesus, the film opens with a little boy being hanged. Yeah, sorry Disney, you lost me at Hanging Little Boy. Guys, it's Pirates of the fucking Caribbean, not Schindler's List. But like I said before, there are a lot of really fun scenes. The climax is really great. There's still some good comedy. But you gotta sit through a lot of boring, complicated, needlessly gritty shit to get to it. And a lot of people just didn't think it was worth it. Personally, I think it's just a little more annoying than the second one. Which didn't knock my socks off all the time either. On Stranger Ties, finally got rid of Orlando Bloom and Kira Knightley and decided just to focus on Johnny Depp, so everyone thought it would be better. But again, there's so much focus on this needlessly complicated plot. He's looking for the Fountain of Youth. That should be easy, right? No, they have to get like a diamond from this glass and put it in there, but you have to get the water dripping from a certain side and one gives you eternal life, one takes it away from you. And then there's also this kind of love interest that poses as Jack Sparrow. I, okay, wait a minute. She poses as Jack Sparrow? Come on, movie. Even we can't buy that. This is like the Pirates of the Caribbean we thought we were gonna see with the first film. Not thinking at all what it's talking about. I actually think Noah's brother Miles said it best when he just asked, can't Jack Sparrow just go looking for some treasure? That's all we really want to see. And he's right. The story in the first one was very simple, just pirates trying to lift a curse. With the second, third, and fourth, it's so all over the place, I forget exactly what the stories are. 
So it's a real mixed bag. I can't think of any sequel that was good all the way through from beginning to end, but I can't think of one that gave me nothing to enjoy either. All of them did have funny moments, and all of them did have some really cool action from time to time. But when they try to get really heavy and really grand and really serious, man, they don't know how to do it. And they shouldn't have to do it! Don't try to tell Lord of the Rings, just tell us Pirates of the Caribbean! That's what we liked with the first flick. So, if you're patient enough and willing to sit through a lot of complicated story to get to the fun stuff, you'll definitely get your moments. But if you're looking for something more complete, well-flowing, and better put together, then in Pirate's Life, this ain't. A high school for superheroes. That is awesome. Kurt Russell as your father. That is awesome. Linda Carter as your principal. That is awesome. Bruce Campbell as the gym teacher. This is fucking genius. So why does nobody talk about Sky High? A genuinely funny comedy with a real original idea that for some reason nobody ever remembers. And I just don't get it. I thought it was really amusing. It's not one of the comedic greats, but it has a really fun idea and it takes every advantage that it can with it. That makes really good jokes that the whole family can enjoy. A boy has two parents who it turns out are superheroes, and they want him to follow in their footsteps, so they send him to a high school called Sky High, which is miles up in the air and in the clouds. That alone is pretty cool. But it turns out the boy and his friends might be a bit of a disappointment as their powers aren't really that great. So they're put into the sidekick part of the school. Yeah, there's two divisions, heroes and sidekicks. And his parents, especially his father, are disappointed but try to make the best of it. But later on his true strength is discovered and it turns out he really is a hero. And this creates sort of a divide between him and his friends. And to make things even better, an evil villain from the past, it turns out is trying to sabotage the boy to try and get revenge on his parents. From here on in, it's action, comedy, flying around, all that good superhero stuff. I really like the angles and the cinematography in this. It really feels like you're reading a comic book while looking at it, particularly with the lighting. The high schoolers in this don't talk as much as high schoolers, but more like Simpsons characters. In fact, the whole thing kind of feels like a Simpson episode, but in a good way. It's kind of aware of the relationships in both schools and family, and kind of mocks and has fun with it. Kids who get bit by radioactive insects or fall into a vat of toxic waste, their powers usually show up the next day. Or they die. There is a bit of a love triangle, but even that gets a few laughs. Mostly because I enjoy these characters so much. Disney is usually so bad at writing teenage characters, but these guys are all really fun and very unique and have their own identities. It's one of those comedies that just throws joke after joke after joke at you. And there's some real good ones, particularly with the running jokes. For example, there's sort of a throwaway gag here where these two boys are making fun of this girl and she freezes them. Okay, that's funny enough. But then, later in the movie, out of nowhere, it cuts back to them. And it's nighttime, and they're still there! Every once in a while in the movie, they'll just cut back to them still frozen. And you just can't believe, did nobody ever do anything to help these two? They just left them there the whole time? That's pretty funny! Sometimes the film gets a little bit into the Disney team romp and it kind of feels a bit like High School Musical, but it's not really that bad. You kind of expect it in a Disney film and you know they have to do it, but I think it rolls out fine. I think my only problem is that the parents, particularly Kurt Russell, are a little too forgiving. At first it's really funny and a good running joke, but then you really start to question their parenting. And I think he gets away with murder just one too many times. But aside from that, I think this flick is a lot of fun. It's a wonderful idea that's child-friendly and has some great gags for both kids and adults alike. It's not perfect, but it's not meant to be. It's supposed to be a fun little comedy adventure with some really creative ideas, and that's exactly what it is. Don't believe me? Check it out and take flight for yourself. With the success of The Lord of the Rings, it only made sense that Disney sort of wanted to do their own version. But, because they couldn't get Tolkien, they decided to go to his best friend, C.S. Lewis. And since Disney is more kid-oriented, it made more sense to go to a story that was also a bit more kid-oriented. Enter the Chronicles of Narnia, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. 
I have to admit when I heard they were making a movie on this I did get a little nervous as I knew the story and I didn't know if audiences would connect with it. It is, when you get down to it, really strange and really bizarre, but they found a really good mix. Updating the effects and tone while still keeping true to the book's spirit. Think Ben Nobs and Broomsticks meets the Two Towers. It starts off in wartime and four children have to be separated from their mother. They're sent to live with a professor who has an enchanted wardrobe. And when you walk inside, you enter into a fictional realm called Narnia. But Narnia is currently being ruled by an evil sorceress known as the White Queen. But as the kids journey into the land and find out more about it, they discover that they're actually fulfilling a prophecy that they would be the heroes to lead her into ruin, and that they would result in the return of Aslan, a giant heroic lion who will bring light back to the good land of Narnia. Colorful characters are met, destinies are discovered, and battles are fought to decide who will rule the Enchanted Kingdom. I was really impressed with how well they were taking sort of these silly images and elements and actually making them very serious. Two of the best friends in this are talking beavers, and I really thought, oh man, this is gonna bomb when we get to that, but it works out really well. The animation on them is very good, and they have very distinct characteristics and personalities. The White Queen is a good villain, and all the child actors do a pretty good job too. And yes, I know that looks like Lindsay Ellis, I've made that joke before. What really helps pull it through is the heart that it has, and there is a lot of it in here. The book itself is very vague and a quick read, but here they give a lot of details to the characters' connection and relationships. The best one being with Lucy and Mr. Thompson. My god, I love watching these two together. That's James McAvoy, who I'm convinced can do absolutely no wrong. Well, almost. The scenes these two have together just knock it out of the park. I almost wish it was just about them. But when the action has to come in and the story has to get a lot bigger, it does exactly that. I'll warn you now though that if you thought some of the religious symbolism in The Lord of the Rings was a bit obvious, this beats you over the head with it. There is no doubt who these characters are, what they're representing, it's in your face. But I didn't mind too much because it still makes for a good story. Even if I didn't know what it was symbolic of, I would still really enjoy it. The only thing I couldn't get into was the story arc with Peter. He's supposed to be the king, the big ruler, the guy who's supposed to come into his own and rule the kingdom, and yeah, he's just kind of bland. I had the same problem with Aragorn in Return of the King. He's supposed to be the ruler, the guy who's supposed to be in charge of everything, and all you do is just see him chop up a bunch of guys, nothing much else. I think if they got that element down, this would be on par with some of the great epic fantasies. But as is, it's still pretty good. It's probably one of the most difficult adaptations you could do in terms of making it serious, and I think it really pays off. The child actors are good, the animation is really good, the effects are a lot of fun, and when you get to the end, it does feel really big. I'm really impressed with it. It's not an easy story to adapt, and I think they did a damn good job. Is it for everyone? No, I mean, if you're looking for something that has a lot more detail and logic to it, it isn't really that kind of story. But for just pure straight up fantasy with a lot of incredible creatures and visuals, this one's definitely worth the trip. So how's this for a dummy moment? When I was a kid, I thought there was only one Narnia book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. I had no idea there were all these sequels that it had. The reason I say this is to point out quite clearly that I never read the book to the sequel, Narnia, Prince Caspian. And I hear that the people that did really don't like the second one. And even some people who didn't don't really like the second one either. But I'll be honest, I don't get it. In my opinion, this is just as good, if not better than the first one. It has a much more heavy and dark tone as the kids return to Narnia to find that it's years later. All the characters they knew are gone, and now this new dictatorship has taken over and everything is in ruin. So the kids had to find their way to get an army and win it back. What I like about this film is that it seems like there's a lot more strategy and a lot more talking about politics. But in a good way. It felt to me like Game of Thrones. Hell, Peter Dinklage is friggin' in it. And he does fantastic as usual. But I think there's more than that. There's a lot of talk about faith in this movie. You don't see much of Aslan in it, but it's very selectively done. He appears in moments that tie into the character's belief, and I think that makes a lot of sense. There's also a lot about temptation in the movie. Peter has gotten too cocky and is afraid that he's lost his way, so the ghost of an evil past comes in to try and tempt him. Sort of devilish, if you will. I heard this wasn't in the original book, but I think it's great. The battles seem much larger too. They seem more gritty and harsh and adult. 
It's not just characters being turned to stone, you see them die, you see them get stabbed. It's pretty intense. But maybe that's what a lot of people didn't like about it. There's not as many fantasy characters in this. They more sort of show up at the end, and even then, not that many. I like the fact that Peter was given more of an arc in this one because I felt it was desperately missing in the first one. The bad guy is great. He definitely has his villainous moments, but you also see he's still human. He's trying to do what's best for his family line, and will do absolutely anything to make it happen. Once again, the ending does sort of come around to a deus ex machina, kind of like the first film, and maybe that threw a lot of people off too. Like, hey, didn't we get that in the first film? Why are we seeing this again? Granted, it's not the exact same one, but it is something that you didn't know existed suddenly comes out and saves the day. But I didn't mind because I was totally in the battle the whole time. I was rooting for the heroes, I wanted to see them save the day, and I thought the action scenes were really good and really intense. I guess for me, I was ready for something a little darker and a little harsher. But maybe that's not what others were looking for. And maybe they did want to follow the book closer. Like I said, I haven't read it, so maybe they're right. Maybe the book did do it better. But as a straightforward sequel, I think it's pretty effective. Check it out and draw your own conclusion. I'm noticing that Jerry Bruckheimer and Disney have this talent of taking ideas that sound completely ridiculous and half-baked and somehow make them surprisingly entertaining. First we had Pirates of the Caribbean, now we have National Treasure. The story? <laughs> Get a load of this. Apparently our founding fathers weren't just trying to make this nation a free nation, but they were also hiding this ancient treasure. That's right, a giant treasure that they believe shouldn't belong to any one man. So they left clues in all their giant landmarks and, of course, only one crazy treasure hunter can actually locate it. He's played fittingly enough by Nicolas Cage, who tries to tell everybody that there's a treasure map on the back of the Declaration of Independence and, big shock, they don't believe him. But he's being chased by a villain played by Sean Bean, who surprisingly doesn't die in this movie. God, I think that's a first. Who's trying to collect the treasure for himself while Cage is just doing it to restore his family name. Along the way, there's car chases, shootouts, a romance, a comedic side character, all that good stuff. So I'm not gonna lie, I was really ready to hate this film, especially from watching the opening. I was laughing out loud at how absolutely absurd this all sounded, but as the movie went on, you kind of realize it's meant to be absurd. But not to that obnoxious point where it's always winking to the camera, it still takes it really seriously, and that's where a lot of the comedy comes from. It actually reminded me a lot of the new show Sleepy Hollow. Yeah, that idiotic setup where the Headless Horseman has a machine gun. But you find yourself actually enjoying it because they do take their stupidity so seriously. And at the center of it is Nicolas Cage, and he is the reason this film works. I think with any other actor, this film would have died. Nobody could find that exact balance of kind of kooky but kind of serious at the same time as him. The way he talks about these ridiculous ideas, he knows it sounds insane, but he's not really rolling his eyes. He's sort of just stating the facts and saying, will you help me or not? But he's not a stick in the mud either, he's still a little kooky. That's very tough to pull off and still have people want to follow you, but he does a really good job. I also like the fact that they really do spend time trying to figure out how to find the treasure. They sit down, they talk, they discuss ideas, they talk about codes. You actually do find yourself getting really wound up in it. If anything, the most boring parts are the action scenes. They're just sort of standard and you've seen them a million times, but it's like the movie knows they're kind of standard, so it doesn't spend that much time with it. The main focus is on the mysteries and the puzzles and trying to find the treasure. And it's strangely really fun, and you get into it. I'd say that if you tell yourself there's no way you're gonna like this idea, then it's gonna be exactly that, an idea you're not gonna like. But, kinda like with the Herbie movies, if you have even the slightest interest or the slightest wiggle room, my guess is this movie might win you over. And I also like the fact that you really forget it's a Disney film. The way they talk, the way they act, you don't associate it with that typical kind of Disney way. It just feels like a straight up action flick that's enjoyable and kind of goofy, but not in a Disney way, in its own sort of unique way. Even the climax is not this big overblown climax. It's actually a very reasonable, smart ending. So yeah, I surprisingly recommend it. 
If you have a good sense of humor, are just looking for a bit of fun and not to take anything too seriously, but not have your intelligence insulted either, then this is a good rent. It's got just the right amount of fun, the right amount of goofiness, and the right amount of action. Go ahead and discover it for yourself. Why is it sequels always feel they have to do the exact same thing they did in the first one? They already did in the first one, why would we want to see it again? National Treasure 2 almost falls into that trap. There's yet another treasure they had to find, and there's yet another bad guy who wants to get to it first, and there's yet another controversy that they have to clear their family name over. As if that wasn't bad enough, we have our main characters who now lost all the money they got in the first film through some really dumb explanation. A scene where Nicolas Cage has to win the girlfriend over again to convince her of this crazy plot so they can fall in love again. And to make that worse, we have to do the exact same plot with John Voight and his ex-wife. That's repeating a storyline from the first one twice! But the good news is, when the mystery and the action does start, it gets fun again. When the characters are all together and trying to figure this all out, it's great, and there's nothing wrong with it. It's still just as goofy it finds more landmarks to find these secret locations in. There's more puzzles, more silly quests, and there's more trailer fodder. Like remember in the first film when he says, I'm going to steal the Declaration of Independence? Well, now this one is, I'm going you to kidnap, kidnap the President of the United, United States. States. Yeah, scenes like that are groaners, and any time they try to recapture the setup of the first one, it fails, and it's stupid, and it's pointless. But, again like the first one, when they try to focus on the actual treasure hunt element, it's still a lot of fun. It's still goofy, it's still silly, but you still find yourself getting wound up in it. Ed Harris is a good bad guy, that's Helen Mirren as the mother, and yeah, even though they have her and John Voight complain a lot, when she's not doing that, she's a lot of fun. I just don't get why they have to separate these characters and start them at square one again when you don't really need to. Why couldn't they keep the money and use some new devices to find this stuff? How come nobody believes them again? Wouldn't it make sense from the first film to believe this guy that maybe if he sounds crazy he might actually be correct about it? But there's still some really good decent scenes. For example, there's this moment where the president is left alone and, like he said, he kidnaps him. But the conversations he has with him are actually kind of fun and engaging. I really enjoy the dialogue where he talks about the importance of his ancestors and his family name. I think it actually does it much better here than it does in the first film. But it pretty much leads exactly where you think it's gonna lead. They find the treasure, they even sort of reveal the treasure in the same way with lighting the torches. The treasure kind of looks the same as the first film. But I'll admit, for the puzzle elements and the adventure and the journey, I still kind of like it. I can't bring myself to actually say don't see it because all the stuff that was good in the first one is still good here. At least when it comes to the treasure hunt. Everything else, man, it's not needed. In my opinion, you could just cut out the first 20 minutes and go from there. But you gotta take what you got, and for what we got, I think it's okay. It's not a bad follow-up, but not the best either. Give it a rent and find out for yourself. Let's end Disney December with their latest Disney film, Saving Mr. Banks. This one is definitely worth talking about because this is the first Disney film that's actually about the making of a Disney film. And not something like the reluctant dragon where you have these fictional characters going through and seeing how stuff is animated, I mean like the real process. I mean Walt Disney talking about developing an idea and trying to work with the author to come to a compromise and creative decisions and choices and disagreements. For Disney, this is really new territory for a film to take. The film stars Emma Thompson as P.L. Travers. She's the author of Mary Poppins and is incredibly resistant to handing over the rights to Disney to make a movie out of it. Why? Because a lot of it came from her true life experiences on the farm. She had a father she really loved who was an alcoholic, and a nanny slash aunt who came in to make everything better. But when the Disney Corporation wants to, for lack of a better word, Disneyfy it, she wants no part of it and keeps saying that if they want the rights, they have to play by her rules. And the rest of the movie is them trying to figure out how to make this film work. Disney wants it one way, she wants it another. It's the battle of the egos going back and forth, back and forth. Disney being the charming businessman, and Travers the brutal purist who wants to see her vision exactly how she imagined it. 
One of the great things about this film is that it's done almost entirely from the developmental point of view. You don't really see the set or lighting or cameras, actors, anything like that. It's all from the development of the sketches, the song, the ideas, and so forth. You don't usually see that that often. Emma Thompson is wonderful as P.L. Travers, but the one that really shocked me was Tom Hanks as Disney. When I saw him in this role, I rolled my eyes and said, oh god, this is gonna bomb, there is no way this is gonna work. But within five minutes, he really won me over. He captured the charming businessman, but he also got sort of that element of he always gets what he wants. He'll compromise, but in the end, he still wants it a certain way and he's gonna get it. When I think back to the movie, I don't even imagine seeing Hanks there. I actually imagine the real Disney sitting there talking with her. That's pretty damn impressive. The movie even shows some elements that I don't think Disney years ago would ever allow. For example, you see Walt smoke, drink, and swear. It's not for very long, but it's in there. You even see him kind of be backstabbing, like when he doesn't invite P.L. Travers to the premiere. This is a side of Disney that I'm really shocked the studio is allowing, but I'm really glad they are. It shows they're comfortable with their honesty, but I think they also realize the importance that this also makes him more relatable and identifiable. All the other actors are wonderful in recreating these roles. The Sherman Brothers, the Driver, they're all fantastic and are given a lot to work with. There's only two problems I have with the movie. One is that the flashbacks, while well done, seem like two totally different movies. A lot of times her memories are a little too whimsical, but you could argue that's sort of her romanticized version of it. They do make it clear that these are her memories, that's how she saw it. So you can technically give it a pass, but the two don't always gel together. I'm also kind of bothered about the ending. Without giving too much away, they show her at the premiere and her reaction to it. Anyone that knows the real story knows what P.L. Travers really thought about the movie. And in this film, you can make a very slim argument that maybe that's what they're hinting at, but no. Majority of the audiences would watch this and think that she's reacting to it a certain positive way. I think it'd be very difficult to find an audience member to see this film and think, oh yeah, that properly represented what she thought of her creation being brought to the big screen. And while those two elements do bother me, I'm still really impressed with how incredibly adult this movie is. Remember how I was talking about 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea and how even though it was a family movie, it was written in a very adult way and how Disney films don't really do that anymore? This film does. This takes it very seriously and doesn't do that much for little kids. It's mainly at adults. Like I said, the flashbacks can be a little too whimsical, and there's even a scene where apparently she's dancing with the Sherman Brothers to Let's Go Fly a Kite, and yeah, it's a touch too Disney-ish, but those moments are very rare. And even then, they're not awful, they just seem a touch out of place. I was really impressed with it, and glad that they chose such an adult angle to tackle it with. This could have very easily been made too corny or too disney but they found a really good balance and used some real sincere honesty to it that I think is very welcome. And in my opinion, I think it really shows the evolution of Disney, as has all of Disney Semper. There's a wonderful scene where Disney talks about how he actually understands what Travers is going through and talks about when he was offered a bunch of money for Mickey. But he said even though he had no money at the time, he could never sell them because, as he puts it, that mouse is family. And in many respects, that's what Disney has become. Family. Yeah, there's a lot of things you don't agree with and you're not always gonna enjoy them, but they were there from the beginning, they'll be there at the end. Disney hasn't really gotten any better or worse, it's just sort of changed. It's evolved with time and knows that it has to be a little different in order to survive. But with those different changes comes all sorts of unique visions. Wonderful characters and new ways of looking at stories both old and new. It's been really great going through all these Disney films through December, and keep an eye out in January. I might still do one or two by popular demand that a lot of people are complaining I should. Oops. But through this month, I've loved seeing Disney evolve, change, and turn into something that is definitely different, but still so familiar. I've loved them so many years ago, I know I'll love them so many years in the future. Thanks for watching, and be sure to still keep that mouse family.
popular demand, and I do mean very, very, very popular demand, Old Yeller. This is the one I probably got the most criticism over skipping. Everyone proclaims it a Disney classic, and the reason I didn't review it before is because, quite honestly, I had never seen it before. The reason? Well, everybody ruined the ending for me. I won't give it away here, but let's just say if you know the ending, you kind of get the idea what kind of story it is, and even though I knew it was probably good, I kind of avoided it, saying to myself, I'd much rather see a film I don't know the ending to. But Disney December, rightfully so, has forced me to finally look at this film that's beloved by so many, and yeah, it is really, really, really good. Honestly, it's among one of Disney's best. The reason being that a story like this can so easily be done wrong. It can so easily be made too corny. It can so easily get wrapped up in sappy music or overly sympathetic speeches, and especially being Disney, you would think that's what was going to happen in this film. But it doesn't. It has a very nice, consistent tone. The story centers around a family whose father, played by Fess Parker, has to go away for three months on a cattle trail. He declares his son, played by Jeff York, to be the man of the house to run things and make sure the farm goes smoothly and all that good stuff. But he gets off to one heck of a bad star when a stray dog makes all sorts of trouble scaring away the animals, eating up a bunch of the food, just being an all-around pain. But his younger brother says he really wants a dog, and the mother seems to kind of agree. A friendly animal, even if he is a troublemaker, would work out well seeing how the little brother now has very few friends to hang with, seeing how his older brother is now taking care of everything. But the older brother vows never to like the dog, while over time the dog does prove his worthiness, and of course they form a strong friendship. From this point on, it's nothing but the experiences and adventures that him and his dog share. Yeah, that's right, no straightforward villain, no money scheme, no any of that dumbass crap that we feel we have to put in these other family films. It's just the experience of a boy and his dog, and you know what, if it's done right, that's all you need. And this film clearly does it right. A lot of that centers on two things. One is our main actor. He does so well playing this kid who is constantly getting crapped on, but still tries his best to pull things through. You can see the frustration, you can see the aggravation, you can see him getting so angry over all this. But at the same time, when things go well, he does legitimately enjoy that too. The whole film centers around when he's supposed to be tough and when he's supposed to be sympathetic. When is it time to fire the gun and when is it time to put the gun down? In this environment, those are not easy choices, and this actor does a wonderful job showing his struggle through it all. And speaking of environment, that's the other thing that is done so well in this film. The pacing, tone, and atmosphere plays a big part in why this movie is such a success. It establishes that it is a very tough doggy dog world, but at the same time there can still be very joyous and happy moments. And it doesn't shy away from either of them. When tough, really depressing stuff happens, it acknowledges it. But when really happy, upbeat stuff happens, it acknowledges it too. It never spends too much time with either one. It equals out so well to keep kids entertained, but at the same time, teach them about the sometimes very difficult world without them being afraid of it. When you get to the end message, which is so in your face it can't possibly be escaped, you really do find that the film, all the way from the beginning to the end, truly supported it. It's a coming-of-age story that showed, at least for the time it was made, the hardships of life and the joys of life. Again, in a G-rated Disney film. So the graphic stuff isn't too graphic, but once in a while that kind of makes it even more uncomfortable. When they're stitching up old Yeller, is that just so much more uneasy when you don't see it being done? They really know how to get the point across, even if they can't show everything. Plus, I didn't know Mike Fink was in this movie! Holy smokes, I totally would have seen this earlier if I knew that! Now, there is one problem I had with the film, even though it might be a side note to many, is how well are these animals being treated? I'm not talking about in the story, I mean like the actual making of the film. I don't usually think about that stuff too much, but I'm looking at a lot of this footage and I was kind of uncomfortable with some of it. I mean, the two dogs fighting, okay, that's just rough housing, no biggie, but a dog going up against a bear? Could they always make sure that nothing dangerous was gonna happen there? Look at the way this kid just tosses this frog and this snake. In fact, why the flying fuck did you give a kid a snake? I know that kind of snake is not likely to bite, but it's still giving a kid a fucking snake! I mean, maybe they were treated okay and it's just really, really good effects, but... I don't know, you got a dog chasing a rabbit, that's one thing, and then you got them running under a mule, that's another thing, and then you got the mule running off after them, it just... Isn't this some really dangerous shit? I don't know, I could be reading too deep into it and it's years in the past, but it made me feel a little uneasy. But, on the whole, the film is, like everybody says, a really friggin' good film. 
It doesn't need to rely on villains or complicated plots, it's just a little slice of life. Written with characters that you care about in situations that you want to see them get through. And all the heavy moments and the happy moments never seem out of place. They seem to just melt into each other so naturally. It's emotional, it's effective, it's a damn good movie. I know most of you have seen it, but even if you haven't and you know what's gonna happen in the end, I can assure you as someone who is in the same situation, it's still definitely worth checking out. Best dog on dog in the By popular demand, Newsies. Talk about a movie people either love or hate. Many of the people I talk to usually have a strong opinion about this movie. It wasn't a critical hit, it wasn't really a box office hit either, but it's gotten a little bit of a cult following over the years. Mostly among girls and young women. The majority of other people seem to really find it annoying and obnoxious. And yeah, I'd be lying if I said I didn't kind of feel that way too. But I don't think it's as black and white as others are making it out to be. It's not something to be ignored or hated, it is something to look at. It's old town New York and a bunch of orphan boys... Okay, I'm not gonna talk like that, but did you notice how annoying that was? That's part of the problem with this movie. But anyway, a bunch of orphan boys get jobs as newsies. Kids that go around delivering papers, selling them, all that good stuff. They horse around, get in fights, they're just a bunch of little delinquents and lovable scamps that you can't help but... question why they sing and spin. Seeing the problem yet? Okay, well let's keep going. Child labor laws and unions are threatened when the cost of papers for the boys to sell goes up. So the boys, led by a very young Christian Bale, go on strike and try to see how many people they can get in their cause. At first, it gets no clout. But through a lot of protesting and riling things up, a lot of people, including a reporter, start to get involved and try spreading the word. But that doesn't stop an evil corporate head named Mr. Pulitzer to try to silence them and bring them down for good. Will the strike finally get enough speed and change the world of newspapers as we know it? Do old-time New Yorkers suddenly dance to Alan Menken music? Well, okay, the answer to that second question is no. And as I said before, that's part of the problem, but not the entire problem, surprisingly. This is not a movie where you feel like no effort was put into it. It clearly did have a lot of effort put into it, and it shows. Really look at this choreography, look at how fast they are, look at how tight it is. This is a movie that clearly had a lot of work put into the musical production part. Then even to the story's credit, it's not that bad a story. I mean, it's talking about an interesting part of history that very few people know about. And even the actors aren't that bad. I mean, Christian Bale is a good lead and there's a lot of good support behind him. For the most part, but we'll get to that. The biggest problem of this film is that it is, in fact, a film. But it's not done like a film. It's done like a Broadway musical. And you might be thinking, what's wrong with that? Hell, there's a lot of Broadway musicals that were turned into films. The difference is, when that happened, they had to make changes. They did this because Broadway audiences are different from movie-going audiences. And with good reason. In a Broadway show, an actor really has to project, really has to emote, and really has to act big in order for the audience all the way in the back row to hear him. As well as feel the emotion he or she is going through. That creates a very distinct kind of acting that's welcomed in theater, but kind of odd in movies. Even for a musical, which of course we know people don't just sing and dance out of nowhere in real life, it still seems a touch over the top for the general audience to get into. I find this ironic because Newsies is now being turned into a Broadway play, and that makes the most sense. I feel like that's where it belongs. But here, it's just kind of awkward, and it doesn't really suck you into the world that it's creating. Mostly because it hasn't created that much of a world. The city looks like a realistic city. The clothes look like realistic clothes. So when people sing and dance and talk this over the top, it doesn't fit. If they did something more similar to what Chicago did, where they really bring in the fantasy and the illusion and the surrealness of it, it might have had a better chance. But as is, the majority of the scenes are just waiting for the songs to come and go and not really express that much and be a little catchy. I mean, they're not awful songs. But they sort of have that typical Broadway sound that for a movie audience kind of creates a barrier for. In film, you can get close-ups, you can do zoom-ins, you can pan back, you can do all these cool tricks with the camera, but everything is shot at a distance. Again, like it's a Broadway show, and that's not what we're watching. 
So, the over-the-top songs and over-the-top acting would work if it was in an over-the-top environment, but it's not. It's trying to make it look like a historical-looking New York of the past. And if you don't want to see a movie and instead want to see a Broadway show that has a touch of a cinematic look, then you'll like this movie fine. I think that's why so many girls and young women do get into it. Many are Broadway fans. But if you're looking for a better balance, say, like what Fiddler on the Roof did, this one relishes its over-the-top feel-good attitude a little too much and comes off unbelievably corny. So I do kind of feel bad for not liking the film because it's very clear that people worked very hard on it. The music's not bad music, the dancing is good, and for what the actors were told to do, they do it fine. It's just in the wrong medium. And I think those filters really can get in the way for some people. So yeah, I did find it annoying and obnoxious, and I did want to fast forward through a lot of the scenes, but I know there is an audience for this that can get into that kind of acting and that wonderful dancing and so on and so forth. It's just not me. I appreciate the effort, but this is a story I definitely don't need to read all about. By popular demand, it's High School Musical 3! I know a lot of you are probably upset that I'm not doing the first two High School Musicals, but on the other hand, I said I'd only do the theatrical ones, and the third one's the only one that got theatrical release, so... suck it! I guess it is really important to talk about at least one of these movies, as High School Musical was a huge thing for a while. The specials were big hits, everybody got the soundtrack, and yes, it eventually got turned into a theatrical film. It made a lot of money for Disney, and a lot of younger audiences love looking back and remembering it. And I bet you're all waiting for me to really tear it apart and talk about how cringe-worthy it is, and... Truth be told, you might actually hear a positive review out of this. Okay, okay, let me talk about it first. After two TV specials about the popular kids now being forced to do a musical and find out they actually enjoy it, we find our main group of phenomenally good-looking misfits are now in their senior year. They're comprised of all the high school stereotypes you've seen before. The jock, the best friend, the nice girl, the weird kind of nerdy kid, and the self-obsessed girl. Only this time, the focus is not as much the play they're gonna perform, but rather what they're gonna do after they graduate. Yeah, actual future plans about what they're gonna do after high school ends. You kinda forgot kids in high school movies are actually allowed to think of that, didn't ya? Particularly in a Disney flick. That's not to say the actual performance in the musical isn't done as well. In fact, they tie in rather nicely. The teacher says that she wants the musical to be about senior year. About what the future may hold, all the possibilities, what it meant to go through high school, all that fun, sappy stuff. The kids coming up with the material actually seems kind of easy because they're going through all the pains and dilemmas that a lot of kids going out of high school are going through. Which college are they gonna go to? Are they gonna go to college? Are they still gonna be best friends? Are they gonna be separated? What careers do they want to do? What jobs are they looking into? What does this mean for their future? All that fun stuff. And that's... kind of it. Yeah, I was kind of waiting for some evil teacher or some snooty student to come in and try to ruin everything, and yeah, there are quote-unquote shenanigans that go on, but they're situations that are only important to one character and not really anyone else. The important stuff is actually focused on the most. And for something that's as mainstream and overbloated as High School Musical, I don't think it does it that bad. The song sequences effectively show what it means to break apart from your friends or to find out where you're gonna go in the future. And the visuals help to represent it too. There's an especially great scene where our main character is trying to figure out what to do with his life as represented by him being in this basketball court and all these basketballs falling and flying and the room spinning and it's actually pretty creative. And it ties in with the story and what the characters are feeling. That's not to say there aren't songs that don't tie in and are clearly just there for fluff, but they're actually kind of creative too, and still tie in to what kind of characters are being represented. But, okay, so it doesn't succumb to some of the typical Disney and high school cliches. But you know they work in a lot of other ones. Like I said, the student stereotypes, the fact that everything is so bright and colorful, the fact that it's unbelievably cheesy as hell, and yeah, it really is. This is unbelievably cheesy. The music is pure pop fluff. The characters all stereotypes, all fucking beautiful. 
all wearing the most fashionable clothes, yeah, it's obviously one big product. But it's hard for me to hate on it because, how do I put this, it's kind of like hating Saved by the Bell. Yes, that's cheesy and corny and over the top too, but it's also kind of a strange time capsule. It captures how a lot of the youth at the time kind of saw the world, or the world they thought they were going to enter. Or it's kind of like Grease. Grease is not a proper representation of the 50s, but it's so over the top and so overblown and so cheesy and so upbeat, you kind of can't help but smile at its naive innocence. And that is how I see High School Musical. It's naive, but innocent. It's not devoid of creativity, or really character for that matter. Like I said, they do really go into the dilemmas of them wrapping up school and what it means for them. And everything is pushing so hard to cement the exact era that they're in. The fashions, the music, the makeup, the styles, all that stuff. It's something to look back on and kind of harmlessly laugh at. But at the same time, it's not something to totally be written off, as there is a lot of effort put into it. The sets, the dancing, the music, they're trying, and a lot of times it is effective. But now you might be saying, how can I like something so cheesy and over the top as High School Musical 3 and not something so cheesy and over the top like Newsies? Well, that's because with Newsies, it was still trying to keep it in a realistic environment. The cities looked like real cities. It was a period piece. I don't think anyone will tell you this film is a proper representation of high school. Everything is over the top, the environment is totally goofy, totally insane, and I think the film is aware of it. Everything is over glorified and romanticized, and it works. There's no point where I could see the director coming in saying, hey, let's make this look more realistic, hey, let's make this look a little bit more dirty, hey, let's make this look like a more realistic high school. No, it's all from the point of view of little kids imagining what high school is going to be like when they get there. So they can have something to look back on and say, wasn't that funny when we thought it was going to be this? But wasn't it kind of charming and silly too? I appreciate how this film gets totally wrapped up in its environment and doesn't apologize for it at all. It is a giant sellout. It is total corporate Disney pandering. But through that pandering, they do allow a lot of clever songs and clever scenery and clever dilemmas. Many of which high schoolers will relate to. Just not on a super dark or serious level. So, does that mean this is a film I really enjoy and want to see several times again? Oh fuck no, one was enough for me. Like I said, it is corny, it is dumb. But it's also harmless, it's also creative, and it also has a lot of effort put into it. And it shows. If you're looking for a serious film that's going to push the limits of what a musical can do and really dive into a character's psyche, then this probably is not the flick. But if you want something like, how I usually refer to it, Say by the Bell the Musical, just a time capsule of corny late 90s and early 2000s that clearly put a lot of effort into it, then, I can't believe I'm saying this, it's actually worth checking out. If you're in a goofy, nostalgic mood and you're of a certain age where you grew up with this stuff, then yes, High School Musical 3 is a very enjoyable movie to check out.